Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 35 of the Friday Nightmares podcast. On this episode, we are talking about impending death, the Final Destination franchise, because we want to. It's our show, damn it. But anyways, I am one half of your hosting team coming to you from Swartz Creek in the county of Genesee, in the state of Michigan, in the United States of America, in the North American continent, in the Western Hemisphere, on the planet Earth, in the Milky Way galaxy, Mr. Smoke Show Crawford. And with me, as always, is... Uh, Heather Powell coming to you from Canada. That's it. <laughs> Just Canada. From Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. The Milky Way. Um, <laughs> like, I know that you're a smoke show and you have an ego that comes with being a smoke show, but that was even a little over the top. Now, nah, that is perfect. Smoke show is everywhere and in everything. He's just like Tony Todd from the Final Destination <laughs> franchise. I just randomly show up. You just randomly show up and you're like, death is coming. I've seen this before. And so am I. Survive. But then they all die. They're like, well, you're a coroner. I would assume that you would have seen <laughs> death before. Thank you. No, I, I fucking love these movies. It's such like... People use the term guilty pleasure and Final Destination films are my guilty pleasure. I love, I love all five. I, I think they're great and they're such yeah. easy watches. Yeah, I was so excited when we decided to do this episode because yeah, I've always been a fan of these movies. Like, you know, there's some hit or misses with the franchise as a whole, like with like some of these sequels, but they're still... How dare you speak that way about Final Destination? <laughs> they're still fun, though. That's the thing. Like, even even the ones that are bad are just still fun and entertaining. Like, I was telling you, like, I, I started watching them on Monday, and I'm like, yeah, I'm just going to watch one and then do some editing. Next thing you know, I'm on to part three already, and I'm going, well, I didn't do any editing. Guess I should probably do that tomorrow. <laughs> You're and... like, edit fuck that shit we got final destination movies right i just i just <laughs> jumped fucking head first into these i'm like yeah i just i love it and i've never watched them back to back to back like this before so it was kind of neat because i was able to pick up other little things like i've been fantasizing that i'm going to go somewhere and have a premonition and save everybody but the problem is that then i die so <laughs> right? i kind of like yeah but fuck i love these movies so much they could make like 10 like some people love Fast and Furious films, hence why we're at like number 10. Yeah. If they could make 10 fucking Final Destination films and I'd be like, take my fucking money. Like, it would just be like, I, I could watch them again and again and again. Because even the worst, worst one or the worst kill is still entertaining. Yeah. And there's so many ways you could go with this franchise. Like, it's just like, it's something that can be repeated over and over and over again. Yeah, you might get bored after a little while, kind of like if you watched That's all like the, how people like, feel listening to our show. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it's still just like there's plenty of ways like to kill people and there's plenty of ways to have these big event premonitions in the very beginning of the movies. Like we're going to talk about some of our out of the dark segments because we're going to kind of come up with our own ideas for one. God. And yeah, like they could just continue milking this cow forever, like if they really wanted to. And I know they're talking about a part six, whether it's actually actually starting to like get the wheels rolling on it or what, but it's been talked about for a while. So I'm hoping that that happens and it kind of kickstarts this franchise into high gear again. Which would be amazingly epic. So we'll see. One can hope that that will occur. Uh, but on a side note, happy Memorial Day, Scotty. Oh, thank you. And happy Memorial Day to all our American listeners and happy late Victoria Day. I was just about to, to say that to all our fellow Canadians. To all our fellow Canadian listeners. 
Uh, Scotty is a busy Scotty this weekend. He's got a lot of things going on, but what are you doing for Memorial Day, Scotty? Well, I am going to a cookout, Heather. (laughs) Also known as a barbecue for everyone else in the world. And see, you know, the reason I call it a cookout is for the fact that, you know, a barbecue in my head is barbecue chicken, barbecued ribs, stuff with barbecue sauce. This is just like burgers, brats, hot dogs, and it's Did you say broads? Brats. B-R-A-T. Oh my God. I thought you said broads. <laughs> I'm going to put some broads Bro- on the bob. <laughs> put, put some broads, broads out there, you know? You're like, it's like the like uh, the wrong term. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Be careful, ladies. Don't wrong Scott or you're going to end up being a broad on the Barbie. That's um, right. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be uh, going to my cousin's house. And just because my cousin is one of my fellow magic players, he's also going to have a table set up in the garage for because all of all the magic group is going to be showing up. So he's going to have a table set up in the garage in case we man. feel like uh, playing magic while we're there. We're going to have a bonfire in the back. I'm going to have plenty of food. I'm going to have some drinks. Just going to be an all day thing. And it's I'm, I just can't wait. It's going to be a lot of fun because every one of us, which is freaking awesome to say this. Every one of us are fully vaccinated. That's going to be at this party. Nice. So it's even nice. better. And yeah, nice. I'm just, I'm excited. It's just going to be a lot of fun. Well, and it's a non-COVID, it's a COVID-free event. Yeah. COVID ain't welcome at this Memorial Day cookout. That's right. We said, fuck you, COVID. That's well, right. And I'll say, hell, pretty much everything's going to be, well, not COVID-free, but events will be happening here in Michigan very soon because, uh, they mm-hmm. have, uh, our governor has announced on uh, June 1st, uh, everything will be able to open at its normal functioning hours again, capacities will be uh, raised, and then by July 1st, the mask mandate will be gone, and holy crap, have events started just rolling out saying, RenFest happening in July, RenFest happening in August, September, October, concert, 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 like it's, everything's just like, we're open, let's go crazy. Which is like, concerning yeah. in a way, but also hopeful. Um, we just got a news today. Now, Canada is caught up to the United States on first dose vaccines. Nice. We just got caught up to you guys. We got shipments in. There was a delay in us getting shipments. And I found out this afternoon that every single Canadian will now have their second shot if they choose by the end of the summer. Nice. So before my appointment was in September my for my second shot, I just went and got my COVID shot in between our recording, actually. Yeah. Um, I went and got the Pfizer, not the old Johnson & Johnson, unfortunately, yeah, but I did, I'm going to get Johnson, that later. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> have, have, have five. Um, but yeah, so... Probably, I would say July, maybe for me, because now we're letting obviously mature folks. So people over the age of 70 are going to be able to go in and book their second appointment, which is they've had it first and it will go back down the line. Uh, So that's really exciting. And we are almost at 55% vaccinated, um, at least one dose. And I think it's like something like 15% second dose in Ontario. So I think we're at Michigan, we're at 59% 59% nice. like and I think uh 46% with the second dose nice yeah we've been it's it's tough right we uh there are some issues between our two countries and getting vaccines but that doesn't stand in the way of Scott and I's friendship no. and there were other <laughs> issues with uh cancellations uh Canada had some cancellations of vaccines being canceled that were supposed to be sent to us oh and uh yeah that was back earlier this year though and also there was the whole uh, AstraZeneca blood clot scandal oh, yeah. shit and people are anyway you know we're not here to just talk about that the bottom line is things are improving and it's looking very likely that scotty will be able to come up here for his birthday in october in september or october um scotty will hopefully as things continue to go our countries are talking about reopening the border officially yes. um, scott will be able to come up here and uh <laughs> we'll go to niagara falls hopefully meet christian and vince from tgif uh the fan the friday fan podcast and also some of my friends and we'll be going out and having a good time. So getting fucking lit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll say, well, I mean, yeah, that's what we'll be doing. It's true. <laughs> well, I'll say, because m- most people might not know, but this is also going to be my 40th birthday. So I'm going to yeah, be celebrating old, in style. Grandpa. Yeah. It's old grandpa. Old Are you grandpa sure you're going right to be able to stay out past 10, Scott? <laughs> I stay up later than you most of the time. You kidding me? <laughs> Please. That's just because there's not much going on here, son. You'll learn. Please. You'll learn. Oh, I've already Wait. learned like how I, you know, you and I can roll together. We've done it. Oh yeah. We'll be fine. I, uh, <laughs> I look forward. It was so, this is how excited my friends are to meet Scott. So I was talking with some of my girlfriends the other night and I said, yeah, you know, he's going to come up hopefully for his birthday. I want to take him on a ghost tour in downtown Hamilton, which is 
just as like Waterdown is part of Hamilton, not that anyone cares, but that's, you know, a sub community. And we have ghost tours. And then there's a club I like to go to called Absence, which is just, it's for people like our age, you know, old, old fucking fogies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, like the age group is usually about 25 to 45. So it's a really good vibe. Um, it's, it's a fucking rundown bar. I'm not going to lie, Scott. Like it looks like it's fucking haunted and it's definitely a front for drugs, but Wait, you don't uh, care absence? when you're there. Absence. Oh yeah. Oh shit. The pictures you se- sent me, that looks fancy compared to the shit that I've gone through. Okay. If you think you this is me? fancy, then the stuff in Flint is fucking scary because this would be, <laughs> yeah. Like anyway, it, they have drag shows, they have DJs, they have lots of live shit. So Scott and I are going to be going that Friday night getting fucked. So we'll probably go live on Friday Nightmares oh, at yeah. some point, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and then my friends want to come and meet Scotty. They're all really excited to meet him. And then Saturday, the plan is to go to Niagara Falls and go through Nightmares. And I haven't gone through it because I'm scared I'm going to pee pee my pants. So, like, Scott's going to see how scary this is because it's scary. Um, one of the scarier haunted houses in North America. So we'll see if we, like get our strength up to do it because i don't really want to i was kind of hoping the borders should never open so didn't have to. <laughs> well i mean but we like, can always bow out and go to a different one yeah but then you're gonna tell everybody no i won't yes you will well we've already talked about this and like you were worried with my back that it might be too much a certain well place. yeah because there is parts where you gotta crawl and scott's used to being on his knees but yeah, i don't know yeah. if he's gonna want to <laughs> be on his knees yeah. <laughs> you know what i'm saying, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> for that that long of a time and hopefully Christian doesn't know this yet, but Christian, if you're listening, I'm hoping that we can meet up <laughs> with Scott on the Saturday night. Christian, uh, Luciani, and I from Exploding Heads live very close to each other. So I'm hoping that uh, I can convince him to come out and go to a bar or something and maybe even can join us and we can all get drunk. And hey, come on, then I'll send Scott home on hungover on Sunday and wish him the best of luck. <laughs> hey, luck come Scott. on. Come on, Christian. You know you want to hang out with a smoke show. It's the once in a lifetime thing. Yeah, once in a lifetime. Like the Milky Way is where Scott lives for fuck's exactly. sake. He's so important. <laughs> um, you know, you can't resist the Scotty. So and you know it'll be really awesome. Dave C, I know you listen to this podcast. I will let you know the weekend we're going to Niagara Falls. And if you are able to meet us in Niagara Falls, which is just across dope. from Buffalo, we should all get a drink or something together. That would be fucking awesome. Yeah, that would be um, fucking sweet. I will tell Dave C when we're going and uh, to see if he would like to do that. Maybe we could get Christian to come out. Can you imagine? But not Brandon because Brandon doesn't leave his house. So Brandon will be sleeping. Brandon will be sleeping. He'll be napping somewhere. We could tell him too, but I don't think he would show up. <laughs> yeah, he, he'd forget what's going on and go back to sleep. Yeah, and that's all he would do. So yeah, so hopefully things are totally like picking up now and movie theater releases are coming out. Aren't you planning to go see a new 2021 soon? Yeah, I'm hoping sometime this weekend, since uh, one thing we didn't mention is I have a four-day weekend because of the holiday. Because I Well, doesn't everyone know? That? Oh, yeah, because today's Friday. So I took yeah. the afternoon off, and Scott took the afternoon off, too. <laughs> yep, I had the whole day off because uh, normally we just get a three-day weekend for the holiday, at least with my company. But I had a week's, uh, week's worth of paid vacation left I had to use up, so I, I have to use it up by the middle of July. So I was like, screw it. I'll just kind of uh, take some extended weekends and use them towards the holidays and since I got these extra time off, I'm planning on going hopefully sometime tomorrow to go see A Quiet Place 2. And I wonder if it's going to be a quiet movie. It might The be. first one was. I hope so. Right? Because that was an awesome experience in the theater. Were you by yourself in the theater? No, nope, but it was uh, me, my buddy Don, and a couple of his co-workers. We went uh, like at a late night recording of it. And yeah, we got there and the theater was pretty freaking packed for it. It was like a late night Sunday and the theater was packed. And yeah, it was dead silent in the theater, which is awesome. Like the movie I thought was good, not great, but I thought it was good because I had some issues with the main, like the main story itself, but the experience was incredible and definitely makes me want to mm-hmm. see the second one. Well, that's very exciting, Scotty. I'm so happy that you get to go to movie theaters, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you're happy. I'm really, as a friend, you know... I'm not at all going to push you towards the scary people in the haunted house. No. <laughs> Never going to be. That. I'll be like, that's for fucking August. Or no, that's for fucking May going to movie theaters. You know, Heather, um, I'm just living my best life. Isn't that what you, you always tell me? 
<laughs> you are. I'm actually really proud of you. You're going out to a bar tonight. Yep. You're like going out with other friends on Saturday. You're going out and seeing friends on Sunday. Like it was hard to figure out a time to record with Scotty. I was like, so when are you around? He's like, well, I'm doing this and doing that. I'm like, fuck. Like all I have is this one <laughs> little hike planned on Saturday afternoon. And I got a work around smoke show schedule all of a sudden. Yeah, like, it's usually the other way around. <laughs> it usually is. But now what is it? The um the apprentice has become the mentor or whatever it is. You that's you true. are definitely the leader of the pack now. So that's something to be proud of, but I am leading in 2021 watches. Yes, so, you are. <laughs> you totally are. <laughs> because poor Scotty can't watch movies at work. How many are you up to now? Uh, I hit my 90th one last night. Oh man, I'm at 99. Cause I got awesome. 99 problems, but watching movies yeah, ain't smoke one. show ain't one. I said, watching movies ain't one. You are still very much my problem. Let's oh. make this very clear. <laughs> you are definitely my problem. So, but you're a good problem to have, Scott. I'll take that. <laughs> you're a good problem to have. Have you had your friend over to watch any movies as of late? Uh, no, no, it's just been, uh, they've been busy and I've been uh, just like pretty much knocking these movies out whenever I had the chance, like free time. Well, this friend listens to this podcast regularly. Yep. So I want to shout out to this friend and thank this individual for listening and always commenting back on the Scott on shit we say. And also going back into our library and reminding Scott of shit we say. <laughs> yes. And we don't remember because we don't remember. <laughs> well, because I mean, yeah, I think we've been doing this for like a year and three months wow, now. We've been so. doing this <laughs> the dog <dark> time. <laughs> yeah, we've been doing it forever. But no. I mean, 35 episodes in, we tend to forget what we said, when we said it and all that. There's a lot that we've done. I mean, I think it's over like a hundred hours worth of like us talking over the like last year and a half. It's crazy. Can you imagine how much of that we could break down to me making fun of you? Oh God, probably at least like 70 hours of it. Well, and that's the quality, right? And then there's exactly. Jerry Hill who feels that you need to be defended, who we will bring on to a show. He will either be on our legion patreon special which has been uh released onto the patreon network is our legion patreon special with jay murph from uh kill the cast on top five yes. uncomfortable movies that will be eventually released on our regular feed for now uh but eventually we'll just be doing patreon only for those special events yes but yeah we will definitely have to have gary on because yep he's my boy likes to stand up for me when heather's being a bully <laughs> Which always is like gets a lot. My, always gets my it's always sunny references that Heather just shakes her head at. Yeah. It's better than Fireball. It's better than that. And it's better than hey guys, did you know one time I almost like Paul Pay Magic? You're well, the one that likes to bring this up. That. Pardon? I said you're the one that brings this up all the time, though, not me. I know. I do it just to be a shithead. <laughs> I know. I don't even do. know why you put up with me. Because <laughs> I, I like the abuse. I, yeah. Like, does your friend who listens to this podcast pull you aside and be like, is there something you need to talk about, Scott? <laughs> no, I think she actually gets a kick out of uh, you picking on me. <laughs> she, so she thinks I'm funny. Yes. She has good taste. Well, I'll, <laughs> and she I'll, also I'll... didn't like killer proms. <laughs> I still feel really bad about that. <laughs> that was hilarious. <laughs> oh, man, what a shitty movie. Anyway, we were supposed to like move into our 2021 film. So let's do so. All um, right. I, did you watch this first film or was it just me? Nope. This is one that's on my list because you and Brandon both told me I should check it out, but yeah, haven't got around to it life, yet. Life partner, Brandon. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're super we're super committed brandon yeah. and i um, fire in the fire in those loins there's a lot of passion for sure between the two of us um so oxygen is a movie that was released in 2021 it's a hundred minute runtime it is available on the netflix a lot of people will probably argue that this is more science fiction-y based. A woman wakes up in a cryogenic chamber with no regulation of how she got there and must find a way out before she runs out of air. So very much a environmental or um, survivalist horror kind of film slash sci-fi. The horror piece is probably more in the, uh, the anticipation of running out of air and being in a condensed area. Probably people argue with me back and forth. This is not horror. I don't really fucking care. Well, I put it on my fits, list. It sounds like it fits the line of that survival horror topic that we always like to talk about. It does. And I have no interest in arguing what is horror or not with people. I find the argument meaningless. So I think it's horror. I think it falls enough in the genre. It's a Netflix film. It's very well acted. 
but it is it does feel it's a hundred minute run time like you definitely do feel like you're watching this movie for a hundred minutes it has a 3.1 rating on letterbox as i said you can find it on netflix it is a french film i believe um, yeah, which makes sense with the director because the director is uh, Alexandra Aja, who yeah. did the Hills Have Eyes remake and uh, High Tension and all that. It's very well directed, very well acted, like good, good, solid film. Do I recommend it? I think if you like survival horror, you like sci-fi, I think this will be something that you'll find very interesting. Yeah, this is one that I definitely want to check out. All right. The next one I think you have seen. I sure have. So the next one is The Jin, And this is a pretty new release. Like I think it just came out over the last couple of weeks. But it's uh, about a mute boy who is trapped in his apartment with a sinister monster when he makes a wish to fulfill his heart's greatest desire. I thought this movie definitely had a come play vibe to it. Mm Mm-hmm. But man, I thought this was a really well done film. Like the acting in it, especially from the little boy is incredible because I would say two thirds of this movie, there is no dialogue and it's Mm -hmm. just because this boy is mute. So like he just doesn't speak, but like you can see like by his facial expressions and his physical acting, like he's a little kid too. He's not like, you know, teenager. He like, he might be like young, young teens, but like, yeah, it had some very creepy moments with the monster or the jinn. But yeah, I think this was a very good watch and I highly recommend everybody check this one out. Um, this movie is my number two and it will be on my top oh, 10. Oh, damn. Yeah, I I love this movie. I First of all, it's a low budget film done well. Yes. Done smartly. Was able to do scares without over the top practical effects. They used their budget well. The acting was good and it built a sense of dread in a, in a simple scenery. And I thought it was better than Come Play. Ooh, I love wow. Come Play, but I actually think it's better than Come Play. Uh, it just hit all the marks for me. Uh, the The visual is the only thing beating this film right now for me oh, personally. Um, I I loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. I strongly recommend it if you enjoyed Come Play. Um, if you enjoy anything with kids in horror, you'll like this film. Uh, the ending I thought was uh, very Grim Brother ish. Yes. Um, so it, you can find this film on Google Play, Voodoo, Microsoft Store, YouTube, DirecTV, and I think it's worth whatever rental you pay for this. I three ninety nine, five ninety nine. If you like what I just discussed, um, kids in horror, come play. Uh, if you like the Grim Brother themes of ending, for those of you who are familiar with the Grim Brothers, you will enjoy this story. Um, yeah. now it is low budget. It is filmed a little bit darker. It is in some darker scenes, but I don't think it's filmed to the point that it takes away from the film personally for me. Um, nothing but respect for this film. Very, very valued watch to me. Yep. Agreed. I, cause I think I, I'm, I haven't really placed it in my list yet, but I think this will be in my, like in my top 10. Yeah. It's, it's just such a high quality film. Yeah. I low really budget. dug this. It will get an award too. This may get an award for best low budget film. Like yeah. It was just. Super well done. Though the other one that's uh, competing with that is the uh, the ranch was another really really oh, yeah. well done film. Um, and that might be in top twenty. I don't know if that will make top ten. But yeah, that's that Death be... Ranch, I think. Oh, sorry, Death Ranch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one about uh, the African American individuals that are fighting off the Ku Klux Klan members. Yeah. Um. Yeah. It was it was very very well done. So the next film, I only put it on here because I couldn't remember if we had talked about it or not. We have not. Like, so I can actually like. I don't remember a lot about it, so I won't be able to say too much except for my just thoughts in general. Okay, so I'll introduce it and I'll remember what I had to say and then you can chime in if you need to. Uh, Sator. Sator? I think it's Sator. Sator. Uh, This is a Shutter exclusive right now. It is a 85-minute runtime. Um, Basically, it's secluded horror about a broken family that is dealing with a supernatural entity as well as... uh, declining health issues kind of mixed with the supernatural entity it reminded me a lot of the one last year the dark and the wicked theme wise Hmm. um theme wise not like it's the same movie but i felt like there were some overarching themes that were similar i wasn't a huge fan of the dark and the wicked last year i respected the film i thought it was a well-made film it just didn't speak the heather language and that's not to take away from the film. It's just my own personal preference. Right. I feel very similar towards this film. I think this film is extremely well made. I think the acting is out of this world. I think the plot is relatively, uh, and the story is relatively good. It just didn't connect with me. I found it a little too slow. I found the whole entity mixed with the uh, 
the client health conditions a little too, it's been done before. Like two on the nose. Yeah, I felt like it was like someone watched The Dark and the Wicked and watched uh, The Lodge and watched other well-known slow burn films and was like, I can make a slow burn film and did that personally. Uh, if you like this film and this is your number one of the year, that is a no hit towards you. And, you know, just because I didn't enjoy it doesn't mean it's a good film. I can recognize the cinematography behind it. I can recognize the acting behind it, the directing behind it. It just wasn't a plot that grabbed me. You know, for example, our good friend Mark Nato gave it four stars. Mark Nato has a specific taste. So if your taste is similar to Mark Nato, you're going to really dig this film. Mark Nato from the Rotten Roundtable and the Horror Cast. Thoughts for you, Scotty? I thought this movie was boring as shit. Um, like you said, well made, well acted, but the story was just not there for me. It felt like, because you said it was like an 88 minute runtime or whatever. It felt like two hours. Yeah. Like, and it was too art housey for me as well. Yeah. Because it did just do a lot of like, ooh, look at these artistic shots. And ooh, yeah. look at this. And like, there was no point in them except for just to say, oh, that's a beautiful shot. However, I did like the look of the creature, the monster, but you don't get much of that till like the almost very end, if I'm remembering correctly. And uh, I, yet again, I didn't dig it that much. So yeah, I, yeah. I don't believe the monster was in it right till the end. Yeah. Cause like I, I seen this probably like two months ago or something like that. And I told yeah. you and Brandon, like, cause I knew Brandon was kind of excited for this. And I went, you guys aren't going to like this. It's way too art house. And like, yep. I knew Brandon especially was going to be disappointed in that. And I think he pretty much had the same opinions as us, but like, yeah, yeah, this was just not for me. Like I just found it extremely boring, beautifully made, but it, nothing well acted, well myself. directed. Like yeah. this isn't a bad film. It's just, it's going to depend. I think if you really like films with slow burn, like if you really like the lodge, I'm honestly going to compare it to the lodge more than the dark and the wicked. Cause I think more people like the dark and the wicked because I think more stuff happens in it. Um, but I found this was a very slow, like plot development, very heavy with like this relationship within the family and why they're living off the grid kind of like, it was just very, it took a lot to get into. So you got to be real yeah. focused watching this one. Um, you, I, I apologize. I said it was a shutter exclusive. It is available on shutter, but it's also available on YouTube, Google play, uh, both Canada and the United States. So if you're going to rent this, if you like what we talked about, then I would say three ninety nine, five ninety nine is fine. I personally wouldn't have wanted to pay that, but I could see how other people will enjoy this. So yep, like to these certain types of people that we know that like these type of films, I'd say it's worth the rental for them, like whatever the price, but like to the ones that are more similar in how we feel, uh, I'd say if you're interested in it, watch it on Shutter, just because mm -hmm. you don't have to pay for it. But eh, just wasn't for me. It's a mediocre film. Yes. Now the next one is the Scary House, also known as the Strange House, and this is available on Netflix. It is a hundred minute runtime. It reminds me of the kind of theme that the Wretched was. Was the Wretched the one about the yep. witch last year? Yeah. Yep. Um, it's very family friendly horror. This is very much like your haunted house story. Kids move into a haunted house. They build some friendships. They have to figure out the mystery of what happened. <laughs> uh, it's an easy watch though. For a Netflix movie, you can't go wrong. If you're paying for Netflix anyway, and you want to put on something, maybe you have a child at home who is starting to get into horror. Maybe they're a little young. This, I would say you could easily show them and they're not going to have nightmares over. There's a kind of a happy cheesy ending at, at that concludes the movie. Uh, the acting's decent enough. It is subtitled. So, you know, you can get um, dubs. There's a dub version on Netflix as well. And there's also a subtitled version. Overall, no criticism, like fun movie. Do I think it will be my personal top 20 material? No, but would I rank it out of the 99 movies that I've, that I've seen in the top 40? Absolutely. Like, I think it's worth a view. I think it's, it's entertaining and it's a free watch on Netflix. I don't think you can go wrong. And it's great family friendly horror. Yeah. This is one that I started last night, got about a half hour in and then went to bed, but yeah, I'm liking what I've watched so far. And I didn't realize that uh, it was supposed to be subtitled until like about 15 minutes and I'm going, wait, the dubbing on this sounds a bit silly. Now that I'm like listening, I'm going, okay, yep. Then I looked, I'm like, oh, yep, it's supposed to be German and subtitled. Okay. Yeah. But it's so. a decent German film. Like, I'll be honest, like compared to other German films we've seen, yeah, right. this one is like, you know, pretty good. I, um, I think it's very relaxing and the hundred minutes goes by really quickly. You know, yeah. it's an easy palatable film good for like your average horror fan or maybe someone just getting into horror 
So the next one that we have on the list here is the <laughs> yes. Army of the Dead, um, which is also a Netflix movie that was directed by no other than Zack Snyder, who's also like the Marvel guy, isn't he? Uh, he is DC. DC, sorry, all the Marvel people. Are- well, I was saying like, I mean, like his greatest achievement would be for me, the Watchmen. Oh, okay. So he did the Watchmen. Okay, yep. cool. Um, you saw this too. So yep, what did sure you sure did. Um, I pretty much went in going, all right, the plot of this sounds like Ocean Eleven, Ocean's Eleven meets zombies. Mm-hmm. That was pretty much right. But yeah, you were. And I went in going, you know, this is just going to be some over-the-top CGI, action-heavy, just dumb fun. I, I didn't expect it to be mind-blowing and be in my top 10 or anything like that. It was exactly what I wanted. Just something fun and entertaining to watch because I thought everybody in this movie just had fun. And like the CGI, like the CGI that's used for a lot of the zombies, especially Zombie Tiger, looked freaking sweet. Um, very predictable, but that did not stop this from being just a fun, entertaining film. It does run at two and a half hours, but it goes by quickly. I did not, it did not feel like two and a half hours to me at all. Like I just had a lot, so much fun with this. Tim and I, my roommate, we watched it together and we just had a blast and like, Finding out afterwards the whole uh, fact that one of the actors, Tig Notaro, who plays uh, the helicopter pilot, wasn't even actually on screen like with the actors and was CGI edited into the film later just blows my mind. Yeah, yeah. I I couldn't agree with you more. I felt like this when I sat down in my like, two and a half hours. Okay, Zack Snyder. Um, now, even though he's not the writer, he's the director. I was like, how the fuck is this movie going to be two and a half hours about zombies and it was it was great you know if you know Dave Batista from WWE and you you know know what to expect from a wrestler turned actor I think your expectations will be fine going into this you're right Scott very predictable but very over the top like very very much like the explosions you would want to see the fight scenes you would want to see like there's a scene in the casino where they're like kicking ass of the zombies and it's great like it's entertaining and if you want to be entertained this is a movie that you will enjoy um I thought it did do something different for the zombie genre. I think it was interesting that they used Las Vegas. I I think the characters, you yeah, you knew who was going to live, who was going to die, and I don't think the oh. ending was overly shocking to anybody. But you know, walking into this, like any, I've seen some really nasty reviews, and I'm like, dude, like you know, not every film needs to be Saint Maud, okay? Like, just turn off your brain and have a good time with this action slash horror flick, right? Like. This ain't gonna be top ten material, but it's just well, for at least for, some for me. People, it may be right. Yeah, I'll say, like I know, uh, I know Tim Davis has in his top ten right now. Yeah, and that's um, cool. Yeah, I'll say like, but you know what? Like, yeah, I have fun with this. It's not gonna be in my personal top ten, but like at the same time, like it's still fun. Like I just had a blast with it, and I like Dave Bautista as an actor. Like he's not the greatest, but he brings a certain charm to the screen that just. It makes it entertaining. And for the role he was assigned to, you know, like for the role of what he was doing. And yeah, you can pull out multiple plot holes from this movie. For fuck's sakes, it's about a group of people going into like zombie-filled Las Vegas. And I thought the opening sequence was funny. I thought that really set the stage for the film. Honestly, I I think you would be at a mist if you skipped this one this year. Yeah, I think this is a really fun, easy watch. And it does exactly what it's supposed to be. And it may get a shout out from me this year. It may win an award. Who knows? Because I think it's a decent film. And I think it's definitely a movie that people should watch. Out of, I can tell you, out of all the movies I've watched this year, it's definitely in the top 30 when it comes to entertaining. Yeah, like, absolutely. Out of, nine, out of almost 100 movies, this is definitely an entertaining film. And it's a free watch on Netflix. So if you're paying for Netflix or stealing someone else's Netflix, you have nothing to lose. Yeah, absolutely. Like, this is just fun. Like, that's that's the best way I can describe this film. Fun. You will have fun with it. We all have a good time here on Friday. Yeah. Nightmares. We know how to have a good time. So this movie, the next one, is called The Retreat. And I was avoiding this film because I thought it looked like a big piece of poo-poo. And wasn't there maybe... another film called The Retreat? No, that was The Resort. The Resort, yes. Yeah. It, we're just going on a lot of vacations here. 
Um, and this is an 82 minute runtime. And no, Sander, I don't like this movie just because it was Canadian. <laughs> just no, Sander, I didn't know that this was Canadian until I got into the film and I saw that it was funded for Tele Ontario, which isn't a lot of money. So the fact that they did anything with the money that Tele Ontario gave them is impressive, Sander Kane. I, so I have to say, though, I just love the fact that Xander Kane called you out of that because he knows your love for Canadian films as well. <laughs> yes, for sure. Absolutely. I just love that he called you out on it, though. <laughs> Sander better wait till those borders open. The land's not that far, <laughs> Sander. Um, but I, I honestly, I think because I had such low expectations going into this film and I expected so little, I was impressed with what I got out of it. Personally, for me. Now, I know the funding that they would have had for this film. So <laughs> I know it wasn't much. These were all Canadian actors and some of them hadn't done a lot up to this point. There was one person that people probably recognized Sean that was in this film, but most people probably didn't know who the rest of them were. I knew who the one girl was. I recognized her in a couple of things, the blonde, uh, okay. but the rest of them haven't been in that much. So it's a basic film about survival horror. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of the same speed of Spiral from last year about being different and people having a problem with you being different. Yep. So they go up to this retreat that is in, you know, a northern place to wherever they're supposed to be living and they are hunted more or less. Now, there are scenes that aren't filmed the best because it's dark. Uh, probably a lot of that had to do with budget constraints and a lot of, and you know trying to keep the, it darker so the special effects would pull off more of what you're mm-hmm. doing um, but I was very impressed with the acting of the film I was very impressed with the message behind the film I thought for a film funded through Tele Ontario and probably because I know more about that funding structure in Canadian media it was pretty fucking good so it's a low budget film It will probably be in my top 20 because of the message behind it, how much I enjoyed the acting and for the special effects that you did see. And I will acknowledge that there wasn't a lot, but for what you did see, it was very good. Um, Especially in the third act. Oh yeah. You saw it, right? Yep. Okay. So what did you think? Sorry, here I am going off. I didn't realize you watched it. Yeah. I told you I watched it a couple of days ago. I forgot, Scott. A lot of things happened. I know. That's why I'm not going to pick on you too much about it, (laughs) but uh, yeah, because you recommended this because you were just like praising it and you said to me especially you should watch this because it definitely has like a relationship based yeah. story in it the relationship was i really liked it but they didn't have it wasn't the main focus of the film so it's not like the relationship horror i love but i have to say for yeah for the lower budget style film this was pretty good like i mean it was paint by numbers with the whole like uh synopsis plot except for just like the meaning behind why they're doing this that was fucked up and yeah but yeah like the like i thought the acting was all pretty good like yeah i wish there like some of the scenes were definitely too dark but yeah for low budget you know you got to do what you can but yeah all in all i still found this enjoyable and yeah it i was on the edge of my seat a lot of times because it had some very tense moments to it i thought that i thought it was more relationship key than you did because everything did revolve around the commitment issue Um, well i mean it did but like i'd say about over half the film really like I don't want to get into spoilers, but they're separated. So yeah. it really doesn't focus on that then. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, it has a 3.1 rating on Letterbox. It is available through uh, Google, YouTube, uh, both Canada and United States, Amazon Video in the United States, and DirecTV. I think if you enjoy survival horror and you enjoy relationship themed films, if you saw Spiral from last year and you maybe are passionate about certain issues, this may like Spiral from 2019. Uh, or sorry, 2020. This may be a a good watch for you. I definitely say a 3.99 rental is worth it. Uh, for some people, there it's not going to be that, and that's absolutely fine. You know, I just I I really like seeing stuff come out of, that's good out of Canada. And I will be honest, I I think we get overshadowed by the United States a lot of the times, yeah. and we have very talented people that live in this country, and that can produce some excellent horror films. Well, the horror films is- in general, right? Yeah, and the sad part is though, I think a lot like the way you get over, the way you guys get overshadowed a lot is because you guys produce a lot of the really good movies. However, no one thinks it's Canadian. Everyone thinks it's American because we're our countries are very similar. Yeah, yeah. So like a lot of the act, the a lot of the actors are you know have the North American accents and all that stuff. Yeah. So it's like it's very similar in that way. So I think that's another reason you guys get overshadowed. But yeah, Canada produces a lot of great films. 
especially on the low budget to video on demand stuff like that's been coming out over the last couple of years. There's been some incredible Canadian films. Absolutely. Like one that we talked about before, the zombie one, Pawnee Pool. Yes. Is oh, it fucking love that movie. Is an, and that doesn't pretend not to be Canadian. That actually no, that is, is like blown. OPP and makes tons of Canadian content in it. Speaking of that, we should probably do a little bit of a promo. Yes. Coming up for our next Legion Patreon special, we will be having on the gentleman from TGIF, the fan the Friday fan podcast, uh, Christian and Vince, and we're going to be talking about the top five. Each of us will be giving a list of the top five Canadian horror films. Yep, and you'll so, be hearing a dumb American talk about his top five Canadian films. No, you're not dumb. No. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so we're looking forward to that. I think a lot of people may be surprised of what's a Canadian film uh, yeah. or stuff that's been filmed in Canada or, or whatnot. Uh, but I did think this was a good movie. It's no Pawnee Pool. I think Pawnee Pool sits in a in a category all on its own accord. Yeah, so it's a tier out tier on its own, like way like, up there. Pawnee Pool is a very solid fucking film. And, and someone could argue the original Black Christmas, you know, depends oh, yeah. where you sit on that, on that fence on that. Um, but I think that this is a solid, you know, low budget film. I think they did a pretty good job of this. It also reminds me a little bit of a low budget film that we watched towards the end of last year about the woman that was hunting people in the forest. Yes. Um, it was a real low budget one about hikers. Uncorked picked it up, I think. Oh, did they really? I think that was an uncorked, not this one, yeah. but Uncorked picked up that other yeah, one that, that we yeah, saw they last did. year, right? Uh, so yeah, if you like Damn, that, that kind was of survival, year, wasn't it? yeah, I know, right? I thought that was a lot year. of movies. Yeah, right. Uh, so if you like survivor horror, horror, this may be your jam. Now the next one, I don't think Scott's had a chance yep, to watch it. I watched this last night. Oh boy, Scotty! Oh, you're right. You did tell me that. Now I remember. Yeah, because I was trying um, to catch up to you and Brandon. Damn it! <laughs> so I'll let you introduce this one then. All right. So this is the one that we actually kind of jokingly picked on a little bit a few episodes back in our out of the dark segment uh because we thought it was going to be a total the craft ripoff and just like be basic bitch and that is called seance well it's directed by simon barrett which i re recognize that director's name so i know he's done some big stuff i just cannot remember what it was but i have to say uh vhs and vhs too yes okay so yep the good vhs's yeah, right we don't talk about viral yeah but uh all I have to say is, boy, were we wrong about thinking this was just going to be basic bitch witchcraft horror. This is far from that. It's about, it's a, uh, I'll give the synopsis. At the prestigious Fairfield Academy, an elite boarding school for girls, six friends jokingly engage in a late night ritual calling forth the spirit of a dead former student who reportedly haunts the halls. And I'll leave it at that because there's a little bit more, but I'm just going to leave it at that. It is well done. Like all these at female act, these female actors in this did a great job. It kept me guessing till the very end. Like I didn't see like where it was going, and like the twist reveal at the end. I'm going, oh shit! All right, interesting. And I have to say, like way gorier than I expected. Like yeah. way gorier. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I just thought this was a all around damn good film. Like really good. Like maybe top 20 material for me like i, I really enjoyed it 100 percent. i think this was a really good film definitely is up for award for me for top pro protagonist i yeah. really got behind the protagonist in this film from the beginning there's an opening scene where i was like yeah girl like i just fucking dug the shit out of her yeah um definitely not what i thought this was going to be i thought this was going to be the craft too yep, it right. is not that it is something completely different there's some great twists in it uh it's a really really well done film i would definitely recommend watching it this year i i think dave z if you're listening i think you may enjoy this film yes um, ignore the cover art because yeah. i think the cover art looks very blah and basic yeah the cover i don't even know what i chose it but it's a yeah. it's a decent film it's a 92 minute runtime it is available on google play for both canada and united states voodoo microsoft store and youtube and it's worth i would say 399 to 599 rental for sure yep i absolutely agree and dave i know you say uh my opinion don't matter because i rate things way too high no, i'm <laughs> kidding i love you buddy but i just wanted to say like i do think you will get a kick out of this movie like because i know your taste fairly well and i think you will i think this would probably sit at least a seven or an eight out of ten for you yeah, I think absolutely you're right, Scott. It's um, it's a very <laughs> well made film, uh, and it's and it and it goes a way that you didn't think it was going to go, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I was yeah, I was very shocked on how like where this went. I yeah, I I I'm just stuttering over my own words because yeah, I was just impressed by it. 
But this next and that one, says Heather, something when it takes Scott's breath away. It does. Take my breath away. That's Scott when he sings to horror movies. Every um, breath you take. So I watched, I, I was finishing up my work day yesterday and I wanted to watch something fluffy and, you know, didn't require a lot of, didn't require a lot of thinking. So I watched Great White 2021. It is a 99 minute, 91 minute runtime. <laughs> um basically it's about a group of people that recreate the film open water <laughs> open water two or three uh so they go out on this you know plane water plane and they land at an island and they realize that there's been a shark attack and they leave to go get help and to alert that you know people have died because of the shark attack and then chaos ensues and it becomes like a survival horror film. If you like shark films, um, maybe really not good shark films, you'll probably <laughs> like this movie. The uh, special effects were okay at times with the shark and other times really shitty. It is an Aussie movie. I can see that Tim Davis watched it and gave it two stars. Probably <laughs> none of those were because it's Australian because he hates Australian films. No, it's uh, none of that. If you, if you don't know who we're talking about, we're talking about a great podcast called Horror for Dummies uh, that you can check out with two Aussies that uh, go over their love of Aussie films and other such things. But uh, and, Tim is and you not can, a fan. And you can hear Tim's love of Jaws pretty much like the, my love of Gremlins. <laughs> right, which, you know, I, I could imagine he was pretty pissed off when he saw this film here. I'll have to listen to what he has to say. Yeah, I'll be um, curious. Um, yeah, right. So, you know, I I think it will be, I think if you're looking for something to just watch that is, you know, a fluffy, shark, predictable paint by numbers film, this is a fine film to watch. I, I enjoyed it because I like watching movies like this when it gets warm out and we start looking at the summertime. I like watching yep. theme beach movies. So this fit right up there for me. Uh, do I think it's a go-to? Probably not. <laughs> it is available as a screener because that's how we watched it. I assume it will be available for rent. I would say probably no more than one ninety nine. And with the caveat that you're really got to like shark films, like any yeah, so so maybe not so good shark films. And this, this may be one I'll watch then. Cause uh, you know, I do love my silly dumb shark movies and whether they're good or bad, I at least give them a watch, especially for, like you said, around this time of year. Right. It's just, I like themes, Same. I think themes, you know? So yeah, so that's it. Oh, and I watched all the, the boys from County Hell. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I watched that this morning. I enjoyed that. Scott talked about it a couple of weeks ago, so I won't go over it too much. But uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. I would recommend that one from Shudder as well. Yeah, a lot of fun. And I'll also, because uh, we talked about this one like the last episode or whatever, but I did watch Unearth. Oh, nice. Adrian Barbo and fuck, great, great low budget. Yeah, you movie. liked it? Yeah, yeah I figured that would it. be up your alley. Yeah. Yeah, thought it was great. Awesome. Awesome. There you guys go. Just listen to Scott and I. You listen to Scott and I, and everything will be fine. It's That's true. all you got to do. We will show you the ways. <laughs> we will show you the ways. So we're going to get into our older films. I know I just have my two here, but Scotty, did you want to talk about older films or? I had no older films besides what we watched for uh, prep for one of our guest spots and one of them's on here. So I'll just figure, and I've seen the other one. So I figured just talk about both of these with you. Okay. Sounds good. So I watched Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. <laughs> 1986 by Mr. Toby Hooper. Um, so much Coke. You know, this <laughs> continues to add to my ununderstanding, my lack of understanding of the uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Um, <laughs> I can see why. And not understanding what the fuck is happening. Uh, this one started off pretty solid. I uh, I dug the DJ stretch. I, I thought that that was a great character. I enjoyed Dennis Hopper's character. And I enjoyed, uh, what's his name? Bill Mosley plays him. Oh, uh, Chop Top. Chop Top. Uh, I didn't get what Leatherface was supposed to be in this. Uh, they made him almost like this goofy, lovable, misunderstood. And horny. And horny guy. I, I, <laughs> I got I got where he was, but it just shifts so much then when you watch like the more recent Texas Chainsaw Massacre movies and like the origin ones where he's not like, like I feel like who Leatherface is, is like 18 different persons personalities no one's really stuck with a set personality for him no no and i like well i mean the one thing that this movie should like like the poster art especially should just kind of scream at you okay this movie is just bananas 
and that is how they recreate the Breakfast Club on their poster for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. That's like the VHS cover and everything like that. So it's like right there, it's just showing you we're not taking this seriously. And this movie, yeah, I, I swear everybody was on cocaine and I swear Dennis Hopper was as, came on set. And they're like, hey, Dennis Hopper, we need you to say these lines. He's going, nah, but but that's what we wanted to give you. Nah, I'm going to say what I want to say which is tear it all down, tear it all down. <laughs> and that, and they're, they're just like, all right, well, we're going to film him in his own separate movie and then we'll splice him into the movie somehow because this man's just gone off the fucking rails. <laughs> but I, I liked his character at first, but then when Stretch brings him the proof that he needs, he doesn't want it. He doesn't nope. want that tape recording. I was like, what the fuck? No, play it on the show. And then bring chop, these guys out. <laughs> and then Chop Top and her have that real awkward conversation about music. Yep, him and his sunny bono wig. <laughs> right. And then the sexualized chainsaw scene. Like I was kind of digging it all till the last act where I was like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on with this movie? Um, yeah, I yeah, Tony, Toby Hooper, dude. Yeah, you know, rock on. It was just such a different flavor from the first movie. Yeah. Oh, it's the so second. different. Like I didn't even understand. Like, I don't know why they called it Chainsaw Massacre 2. They should have just been like, you know, m- like Chainsaw Killer. And it would have been like it could have been a completely different film. Besides Leatherface being in it, what was really the connection? And yeah. even the Leatherface was so different from the original Leatherface. Well, and then there is a connection with uh Chop Top, uh, because Chop Top is the twin brother of the crazy hitchhiker in the first movie. Well, yeah, and Dennis Hopper's son is supposed to be the kid that was in the wheelchair, but those aren't yeah. real connections. They're not built on anything. It, no, no. The movies just... don't even flow together. No, not at but all. Final like, Destination they don't even... floats together better than these fucking films do. And it's they different so people except for in the second one than all those other movies yeah um but i do have to say uh, i'm gonna give a shout out here but uh if, uh, if you want to hear some like really in-depth thoughts on this movie check out cinema psyops because they just hit their uh five-year anniversary and they are covering each uh movie in the texas chainsaw massacre franchise in chronological order like by when it was released and they just released part two last week and part three is coming out this week and court and Matt go into some great detail about these films and brought in some knowledge. I didn't even think about like about what these, some of the stuff that went behind the scenes and like, but yeah, listen to the cinema psyops. They did a great job covering this. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad somebody covered it. Well, um, because it's a hard <laughs> film to watch, uh, entertaining though. I'll give it yeah. credit for that. It's and just so bananas. Like, it just that's, is. It's crazy. Much like the next film we're going to talk about by Toby <laughs> Uber, uh, Eaten Alive, 1976. Oh man. Uh, we did this for the Cemetery Gates podcast. Uh, which is one of our favorite podcasts to listen to with Sandra Kane and Android virus. And um, yeah, I enjoyed it. Uh, it's basically about a killer crocodile that lives as a pet in this rundown hotel, you know, for the lack of, you know, any other plot line. It's basically that. Yeah. And uh, Robert England's in it. A young Robert England. Yep. I'm Buck and I'm here to fuck. I liked Buck a lot. I thought Buck <laughs> was hilarious. Well, I'll say he kind of has a character turn because he's like a complete asshole. But then by the end, you're like, oh, no, oh, no, don't die. Oh, Buck. Oh, <laughs> beating it to fuck. Oh, Buck. Right, Buck. Oh, uh, Buck. Oh, oh the fuck. Buck. I, it, it was it was fine. Um. I I thought it was an interesting 1976 film. I think it definitely was like, <laughs> I feel like in the 70s, they're all just like, ah, fuck, throw this film together and we'll see what happens. <laughs> like, yeah, and I was, I was going to say, since it's Toby Hooper, I think this is his uh, second film right after Texas Chainsaw. No, and what then, a follow-up, right? Yeah, and then I think he did Poltergeist, then Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. But it's kind of funny because you can kind of see like in Eaten Alive, it's a blend of both Texas Chainsaw 1 and Texas Chainsaw 2. Like it's yes. got some of that dirty gringiness of the first one and then the batshit craziness of the second one. This reminds me of a grindhouse film. Yes. Oh, it absolutely is a grindhouse film. Right. Like and I and I just I I appreciated it for what it was. I definitely did not find it boring. I did find it interesting. Uh, but it's hard to follow. Like I find films like this, you're like, what, what, what? Okay, now, okay, why is someone acting like that? Why is that random line happening? Why is this randomly happening? 
and you're not quite sure who your main characters are going to be because there's just so many random fucking characters to show up like it's like having a party and like you sent out the invitation to two people or 10 people and then 50 fucking people show up and you're like what like it's like that right and i was gonna say that especially when you were talking about this crazy characters like why are they saying this acting like this the family like the husband that shows up with his daughter and his uh, wife and just some of the things that he says you're going where the fuck is this coming from what are you doing why why is any of this happening <laughs> like it i just, just such, it's so nuts right it's just so fucking weird but yeah but, i like you i had fun with it though but it was just nuts <laughs> yeah so that was that was my two older films that scott has also seen because scott doesn't watch a lot of movies anymore unfortunately not you know he has to he has to work hard and also he's a smoke show and as a smoke show there's a lot of smoke show commitments true i mean right when you're when you're when you're smoking like me just, just <laughs> where there's smoke there's fire <laughs> where there's smoke there's an extinguisher to put my ass out <laughs> and then uh we'll break into what we've been listening to uh scott did you you don't have a podcast listed here i i, assume. <laughs> I, I do have one about. i have one i just forgot i just didn't put it on here would you like to talk about it <laughs> Of course. That's all I say. I was, I was gonna, you want me to start then? Yes, you go ahead. All right. So the uh, podcast I was going to uh, bring to this uh, episode is a uh, new collaboration or might be an old collaboration that's come back, but it's with Ricky Morgan and Court Psyops, and it's called Mental Rental, and it is on the Legion Patreon, and they're going to be doing this as a once a month show on the Legion Patreon uh, page, so hopefully a little more incentive to get people to join. This is a commentary style episode where they just watch different movies and go in depth with like the quality of the film, the transitions of the film, because they do like the Blu-rays and like they'll talk about what release they're watching and what version of it and this and that. The first episode they released on Patreon is over the film Rolling Thunder, which Heather and I had graciously had the chance to watch because of Android virus on It's Not Horror which brought the whole show oh, to a depressive state where we just did nothing but comedies after that. Nope. <laughs> um, but yeah, Ricky Morgan and uh, Corsi, you know, they are huge fans of this uh, era of film and genre, and they just do an amazing job covering it. And I just wanted to bring it to the table to mention, because, you know, this is the type of content we're getting for Legion Patreon now. And it's just, it's great. We're going to have all this new stuff to listen to and, I, I just love these uh, collaborations that are coming up now. And we are many. We are many. So mine is uh, more from the podcast network. <laughs> and they keep coming up with new shows and I just keep fucking downloading them. <laughs> but this one is called Superstitions. And it's a half an hour episodes and it goes over why certain things have become a superstition. So the first episode I listened to is on black cats oh, and nice. how black cats have been basically manipulated ma- ma- or... Um, their image has been used by religious groups as something evil that it actually at one time was seen as something positive and it's been shifted by, I'm sure you can guess which faith to Christianity, right. To represent something. Catholicism, I should say. Yes. So it's a really good short half an hour story. So they do a little bit of background. Then they tell kind of like a fable or a fairy tale about a situation with that superstition. And then they close it off with what's currently happening in regarding to that. So talking about like how black cats are the hardest cats to be adopted in shelters and stuff like that. Which so, is so sad. It is sad, but I think people are beginning to understand that that doesn't actually mean anything. Right. So yeah, it's, it's really cool. I really enjoy it. If you're looking for something that's short, simple to listen to, and you want to maybe learn more about why superstitions exist and also how they lead to different like things in pop culture. So we have a lot of horror movies that are based on superstitions and yep. even some stuff in final destination. Some of the deaths are based on superstitions. So, yeah, you know, there's a lot of those connections there. So I, we would recommend, or I recommend listening to this podcast. Nice. Yeah. This might be something I'll have to give a listen to at some point. Because I, I do like the whole idea of like the basis of superstitions. Baby superstition. I was w- I was gonna start busting out that like because I was gonna bust out that song at some point, but I was like superstitions, superstitious. Eh, I, 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 I can fit it in. You're like I can do this because it's me and I'm a smoke show. <laughs> and it's based and I, and I just think of the movie The Thing because that movie plays or that song oh, plays in it. Nice. Very superstitious. You and John Carpenter and fucking Gremlins. I swear to God. If John Carpenter made a Gremlins movie, I know you'd be like, it's fine because John Carpenter made it. 
Oh no, I I am a critic of John Carpenter's for some films. Well, I'll say that because there I, I love, a, but he is him and Stuart Gordon have probably the most filmography that I love. Is that right? Which one of John Carpenter's do you not like? I am not a fan of the Invisible Man, um, or memoirs of the Invisible Man, um, Ghosts of Mars, The Ward, Vampires is fun, but meh, like not really great. No. Um, there's a few others in between, like like that have grown on me, but they're still not like like high quality watermark films. I hear that. I hear that. Well, I guess we should probably move into our main topic soon, but we should probably hear a promo from uh, one of our friends of the Legion Podcast Network. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. This is a test of the emergency podcasting system. Listen to the Psychosemantic Podcast. Politics, movies, and political movies. Find us on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, legionpodcasts.com, the Psychosemantic Podcast. And welcome back. So as you know from the opening of our episode, our main topic today is predicting death, uh, premonitions and other such things. Scott, do you believe in premonitions? Um, kind of, yeah. Like I Have feel you ever there's had a premonition. Like, I've had like you just like these gut feelings before, and sometimes they've come true. I um I've been able to do this creepy thing where I predicted order of death. Oh, yeah. I've uh, I've been at funerals and seen other loved ones there and predicted you'll die next. Oh wow! Like, yeah, um, not and it and it just, sometimes just comes over me like this person will be next to go. Now, mind you, it's typically been older people. Um, I've also known when someone's in like a life or death situation and like I'll be like they they'll make it out and they make it out. Um, So, you know, that could just be a lucky guess. That could just be because someone's older and looking at health issues and guessing how things are going to go down. Uh, Or it could be deeper than that, which is- I'll say like, probably mine might be a little deeper than that at some points, because there's been times where like, uh, I just get this bad feeling like I probably shouldn't go do this today because I just have this feeling that something's not going to go correctly. Mm -hmm. And well, one of those times was got in a car wreck. Really? Yeah. Like, in yeah. Just- sometimes you have that feeling like today's not a good day. Something's going to happen. You go out and do something, yep. something happens. And now you could argue that could be you making that happen because yeah. you're already in the negative, you know, thought or process or that it was, you know, a sequence of events that you had no control over, which is really what the final destination franchise is all about. Right. right? Which makes it kind so, of fun. Mm-hmm. So of course, like always, we like to do some research and talk about, you know, some articles on that. So exploring premonitions of death and their meaning. So this is an article that talks all about what people do when they explore their premonitions. So a premonition of death doesn't necessarily mean you're going to die. A premonition may be a warning to sign to prevent an untimely death, like in Final Destination. Not everyone who has a premonition of death is a psychic or a medium. This type of premonition can happen to anybody. How often do people have death premonitions actually die? People who have a premonition of their own death don't necessarily die. However, people who are in an accident or other types of trauma also have such premonitions about their death. Study a patient premonition of death. So the National Center for Biotechnological Information conducted a survey of 302 trauma members about patient premonitions of death. These were accounts of the patients expressing a feeling or sensation of death. The result revealed that these patients were most likely to die. Other results of survey of of trauma health workers included 50% of trauma patients expressed a premonition of death. 45% stated patients can sense the outcome of their situation. 50% said that people who have premonitions have a higher mortality rate. And 57% believe patients affected, affect outcomes through the patient willpower and desire to live. So if I think I'm going to die, I'm going to die. If I think I'm going to live, I'm going to live. Um, can you have a premonition of your own death? 
There are instances where people have premonitions of their own death. There is a type of deep knowing within. So David Bloom's eerie email for his final death. So the last email that David Bloom wrote to his wife hours before he died made people wonder if he had a premonition of his death. Bloom's last email was read at his funeral. Bloom died of a pulmonary embolism from an undetected dislodged deep vein, believed to have been caused from riding in cramped military vehicles. The Reverend's father, the Reverend Father Matthew McGinnis, spoke of Bloom's confiding in him about his death on the night before he traveled with the military for Kuwait City. Reverend Guinness said Bloom spoke of how he was prepared for his own death. Hmm. Very, very final destination. Life. Yeah, very. <laughs> Premonitions of death without knowing who. There are people who have premonitions of death without knowing who. You may have a premonition of tragic events, but not know where or when or how or why the events happen. This sounds just like Final Destination, right? It really does. Right? This was the case of 9-11. Many who perished in the 9-11 attacks had premonitions of their death, as did those who survived by acting on their death premonitions. So being late for work that day. We've all heard the stories. I was supposed to be at the World Trade Center, but then my babysitter was sick, or then my kid was sick, or I was stuck in traffic, or whatever the case may be, right? Right. Um, 9-11 premonitions of death. So sometime after the 9-11 terrorist attacks, it was reported that many 9-11 victims had premonitions of their impending death. Many would-be victims heeded the warnings they received and didn't go to work or board the plane that day in her book messages signed visits and premonitions from loved ones lost on 9-11 bonnie mcnearly tells the story of 9-11 victims would be victims family and friends who had death premonitions bonnie's husband edmund died in the attack and she writes that he had some kind of premonition or several premonitions over the course of a year many people reveal several premonitions and feeling that they felt they felt or either they felt or their loved ones did so this happened to me when i got sick I always knew I was going to be sick and hospitalized one day. Always, 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 really? always. Yeah. I knew that something was going to happen in my thirties and that I was going to be, you know, basically on my deathbed. And I did almost die. My potassium levels dropped so low that when I was in the ER and they rushed me into the cardiac unit, they said, we don't know how your heart's beating right now. It's yeah, like, that's crazy. There's no reason you should be alive. And, you know, they're, they're, in, they're injecting me with potassium. They're feeding me potassium, anything they can to get my potassium levels up. I'm in the cardiac unit with a bunch of old men <laughs> in me. Um, wow. And eventually the nurse comes around and goes, do you work out? And I said, yeah, I, I run, I do stuff. She's like, that's what kept your heart going. No shit. Because my heart was strong enough to keep beating with low levels of potassium. It was at 2.9. You're supposed to be in serious danger after 3.1. That's like, I remember you telling me the story when we first yeah. met, but wow. I didn't yeah. know about that part. And I always knew that would happen. I always knew I would get sick. And I felt like once I crossed past that, I stopped worrying about it. It's like, I always knew I'd be married and divorced. I always knew that. Hmm. I knew I would never be widowed. I knew I would be married and divorced. As a young kid, That's I crazy. knew that. And my parents are happily married, been married for like almost 50 years, Right. you know? So it's, it's, it's just really interesting that sometimes, and now you could argue, maybe I made that happen, but I don't think I made myself get celiac. No. You know, you could argue my divorces, perhaps that was, you know, choices I made of who I married and, you know, whatever, but like, you can't control whether you get celiac disease or not. And whether that gets mixed diagnosed or not, you know, I had a lot of misdiagnosis and other shit too. So it's just really interesting. So the more I read this, I, I do believe there's some kind of relevancy to it. So then there's also the strange feeling that someone is going to die. If you have a strange, sudden strange feeling someone is going to die, but you don't know who, there's little, little, very little information for you to act on. Yet again, final destination. Yeah. This kind of premonition feels cruel. And the only thing you can do is wait. This really is like in the second one. I found yes. that she didn't have a lot of information. Other ones, I feel like they had more information, but in the second one, she was like, because she didn't know any of those people. No. In the other ones, they all kind of knew each other. Yep. Uh, I'll say it except for part four. No, part four they did. You had four friends and they all sat each other and they all interacted. Right. Oh yeah, those ones did, but then yeah, the right? rest of the people, they didn't know. Right. Nah, I, I don't know. We'll get into the debate later. I think I think number two was really the only true one where they- Yeah, like they, number other. two is definitely the right. main one. Um. So where are we? Oh, medi uh, mediate to, full, to explore further. You can, sorry, meditate to explore further. So you can meditate to explore your premonitions further. Meditation is a more focal process that reconnects you to the spiritual world. Once there, you can ask for clarification from a guide or your higher self. Um, premonitions of symbolic death. It's important to realize that all, not all premonitions death are meant to be interpreted as literal death. 
It could be a symbolic death, such as a death to your current way of life. It could be the death of a career or a relationship. If you're on a spiritual path and are striving to evolve spiritually, the dream could be symbolic of death of your spiritual being being reborn into a higher level of spirituality. And then finally, examining possible symbols of death premonition. Um, if you have a dream of dying or an actual premonition of your death, take a breath, calm down, examine various areas of your life to, to determine if anything is coming to an end, such as graduation from college, an upcoming marriage, a career change, a move to another city. These are all life altering events that could be a symbol, a symbol of death. Premonition of death and what it means. There are many possibilities for the premonition of death. It can be a symbolic form or it can be a prediction warning that you can act on. The end. So that kind of left it kind of cliffhanger. But uh, I think that's a really interesting article and we'll show the link to that article as well. But it kind of just sums up our fascination with, you know, knowing what's going to happen or wanting to know your death because death is something that comes for all of us. And Tony Todd says that. Yep, one sure of the does. Movies. And uh, he's right. You know, it's unavoidable. And, you know, there's this belief that if you cheat it, then you're, you're scot-free, but there's eventually the end of the line, which is another, another phrase that is used in the third movie. There's a lot of real cliches and some really great lines that go into the Final Destination franchise. So, oh, for sure. Let's dive in. Scott, All right. kick us off. So the very first Final Destination was released March 17th in 2000. Alex Browning is amongst a group of high school students readying themselves for a trip to Europe, France. When he suddenly has a premonition that their airplane will crash, he screams to warn the others, but instead he is thrown off of the plane. This one, uh, I'm trying to remember, like, I think I've seen this shortly after it came out on DVD, VHS, whatever you want to call it back in the, back in the day. And yeah, this got me and made me fall in love with this type of idea for a film because, yeah, the whole paranoia of, like, a plane just exploding in midair or crashing, like, is a general fear that a lot of people have of flying. You and, have that fear? Um, I used to, but I've gotten over it. Even though I've never flown, I've I've already gotten over it because I know it's a lot safer than, you know, what it's presented as in, like, movies like this. But, uh, yeah, like, I really do love the idea, like, and you get this in every one of the films, but I love the idea of, you know, even though he saves everybody, like, all his friends and people that are around him, like, you know, it's, the event still happens, but I, what I like is you still get to see what would have happened if him and all of his friends stayed on board and you get to witness all these horrific deaths and kind of cool scenarios, but at the same time, kind of haunting images, as we'll get into with some of the later films. Um, but I really like the idea of this whole premonition and because, yeah, they all, all these kind of work off the of base of a inner fear for some mm -hmm. person or another. And I think it's just really cool. And then the whole concept I thought was very unique, especially for the time of death has a design and yeah. will come for you after, like, if you have somehow screwed up his plans, death itself will come for you and everyone else again. He will just come full circle and come back for you. I love that idea. I think it's funny that you used a male pronoun. I, you know, I'll say like, I didn't even realize it. Yeah. Right. And I think I would use a male pronoun too. I think it's because we see women as life givers. Yes. Right. And I, and I just think that's interesting. Right. Like, um, but I think, and it's presented as a male. We do believe that that, you know, it's the aggressor, right. Which is death in this. And even though death is unavoidable, uh, we see a bunch of like little, uh, what do they call them? Easter eggs leading up to Alex actually going on the plane of little things happening, the flight board acting all fucked up. Um, when they're boarding the plane, he switches seats and the envision that he has of what happens. And there's a gentleman that obviously has a cerebral, cerebral palsy that's sitting in the front seat yes. of the plane. And I really felt for that character. Oh, I know same. that character isn't even, doesn't even have a main part, but I thought it would be terrifying enough to be of, you know, aware of what's going on. I can't imagine how it would be feeling to have absolutely no control and then not being able to explain to somebody what's happening. Right. Um, and that, and taking off like taxiing is what they call it is, is the most, is the most dangerous part of flying. I remember I was flying with my ex-husband out of Vegas years ago and uh, it was really windy and the plane had a hard time getting up. So it was doing this thing where it was kind of jolting a little bit. And he looks out, he's like, man, look at the, look at those wings. Like the plane's having a hard time. And if you've seen this fucking movie and you know anything about flying, you don't want to be looking out the window at the wing. Okay. No, no. <laughs> and I like fucking lost it on him. 
And I was like, you need to stop because I, and that, after that point, I've now had a fear of taxiing and landing. It oh, now okay. Um, because it was that feel and and we got it and they got it up just fine like plane crashes are not normal they don't happen frequently uh but it was it was scary like I was scared um and I think that this film does a really good job of playing on that fear and I think Carter's reaction who is the gentleman that uh Devin Sawak character gets into the fight with is very realistic of how you would probably feel after living you know you're you're mad at this kid because you're like i don't know you anything i control my life blah 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 because there's survival guilt that's presented very well by all of these characters yeah particularly the teacher oh absolutely because yeah she she sends because it was a co-teacher thing like Mm -hmm. and she sends the one that speaks french because like they like i was saying they're going to france and she says they both get off the plane when this all happens and she says one of us has to be on with the students that are still there you go ahead because you speak French pretty fluently and which made sense why she would send him back. But like, but then, yeah, she felt guilty because she put pretty much sent him to his death. That could have been her, but she ended up replacing him with someone else. Right. And I, I think it's very normal that he, like when Devin Sawa's character freaks out and hits, uh, hits Billy Hitchcock on his way out, which I find really funny because I can't think of anything other than Stifler every time I see him. Yeah. You just in, like, well, I think of Stifler every time I see him, but in this film, he is literally everybody's punching bag. That poor guy. <laughs> he really is. Right. Carter, and, you dick. Oh my gosh. And, you know, and, 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 uh, Devin Sawa's character, Alex yells out, you know, the plane's going to blow up the plane going to blow up and of course the fbi agents like this is before september 11th this is a year before that move that happened right and they're like so why do you think why did you say there was a bomb on the plane i don't know if they could have got away with making that movie no this well this movie came a year later yeah this movie probably would have been shelved and pushed back multiple years then got released right so you know and that makes sense that the fbi would be questioning him like we're in the fifth one it's like all right dude (laughs) What are you doing? Obviously, you know, this guy had nothing to do with what happened. Right. Um, this, you kind of, you know, get a point. But the the acting of the FBI agents is painful. But that's a whole other <laughs> right. side, side thing. But I, I really do enjoy the way that they play on the survivor's guilt, how one person will thank them. Um, like one person, like Claire, Claire Rivers, like, thank you, I'm alive because of you. Um, you know, the other guy's mad at him. The teacher doesn't even want to be around him because it creeps him out. Billy's all like, can you predict what's going to happen? Am I going to pass my driver's license? <laughs> right. Am I going to hook and, up with this chick? Right. And then poor Todd loses his brother, George, because he gets off the plane with Alex. Yeah, and they were the dad has, brothers. Right. And the dad has resentment towards Alex, which all this makes sense. This is yeah. what would happen. You know, if your child died and there's only eight people that survived on a flight of probably like 140 people or whatever it was supposed to be, um, or more, maybe it was more people on the plane. I can't remember the number of people on the plane now. It was a Boeing, a Boeing 747. So that's a big fucking plane. Right. Um, like I, I thought that they captured all that really good. Like we haven't even got to the premonitions of death yet. I think they just set up the scene for survivor's guilt and, you know, Alex having these visions and then people being afraid of him afterwards because of what it meant. Like, yeah. I think they set it up really well in this movie. I completely agree. Like, uh, cause like, yeah, you even see like everyone like has a different reaction to Alex. Um, and then you see Alex who has like probably the most survivors guilt of them all, which like just becomes obsessive on why this plane did what it did and why he had this premonition, which that is one thing I did want to bring up like as a question did these like in all these movies did the people were they already somehow empathic or psychically linked before because how did everyone like each person get a premonition like how like is there some were they already born with these like innate abilities to have this premonition or was just this something that death just kind of accidentally let slip like oh giving you a vision of what's going to happen well, I think if we looked at the article we just read, it could argue that different people have that ability to sense that. It depends on 
how open you are. Obviously, Alex was quote unquote open to it. Yeah, um, that's true. Right. Which is how I think it's a fair argument. And I get you're trying to look for a logical thing that connects all of them. That would have been interesting if they went with that. Yeah. Uh, but I think the problem is that it was written. All the movies were written by different people. And James Wan only directed the first one, the third one, I think. Uh, it wasn't James Wan. Um... Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, written? James... You... Oh, you written directed... it? No, directed, directed by James Wan. Wait, what? Yeah. That wasn't who showed up when I looked it up earlier. Oh, James Wong. I thought you said uh, James Wan from uh, the Conjuring universe. No, Wong. Wong. Oh, okay, Wong. okay. Sorry, I'm ba- my bad. I, I misunderstood you. Right, so I, he directed a couple of them. Yeah, he did um, the first and the third one, and then there was the guy that did the second one, also directed the fourth one, which huge letdown. But uh, And then part yeah. five was somebody completely different. Right, so I, I think that maybe that would have been better connected if there was more of that kind of connection throughout it. Uh, but there wasn't, and that's okay. That happens. So when we look at Final Destination, what what deaths stand out to you? Um, the one that always stood out to me is uh, Todd's death, because that one feels like the most realistic and uncomfortable to watch. Just watching mm-hmm. someone like slip, fall, and like pretty much just hang himself, because the camera pretty much like focuses right on his face and it shows like his eyes going bloodshot and like his blood vessels popping and everything when he like really starts. Yeah. It's it's a very realistic what it would look like to hang. Right. Yeah. Like that one was like probably the one that really stood out for me. And I can't remember what was Alex premonition of that. What did he see? Um, That was also one thing I was going to bring up, but uh, the premonition for this one was he didn't see it coming like per se, but a magazine he was reading got shredded by the fan and Todd's name got cut out of the paper. And so we saw that it was knee. Todd's name was that he was going to be next. Yes. And then um, the dad thinks it's Alex's fault that he felt so that Todd felt so guilty over George's death that he hung himself. And Alex is like, then why was he, I thought this was smart writing actually. Cause he says, then why was he wanting to go to the ball game with me next week? Now we all know that people, right. if they're serious, kill up killing themselves, they don't lead it on. Right. Um, but I thought that was an interesting tie-in. Um, and then that he was there and then that him and clear had this like connection to each other and that they could now sense death as well, that she could feel what he feels. And that dark, eerie sense is constantly always around them. I thought that was really clever. I, the death that I think is the most interesting in this one is the teachers because it's yes. so drawn out. Yeah, and it's the most violent one of the all of them. Yeah, and I feel like it's because it was just, and I don't know why, that one particularly got dragged out because Billy's death is quick. He gets decapitated. Yeah. Like it's not, it's like, bam. And like the scene leading up to it where you think Carter is going to die is much longer and more intense with the, with the train. And, you know, he's like, I can, I control my destiny, you know, definitely trying to challenge what Alex has said to him. And then the car doesn't start. Right. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever played trick in on the railroad railroad tracks. Before. Oh, hell no. Oh, okay. Of course, neither have I, um, <laughs> but that's just that no that's like an adrenaline junkie thing right there hell no <laughs> i ain't fucking right with train <laughs> right absolutely not well, a good decision well explains sure. a lot about you because i know you do have that adrenaline rush <laughs> i do it's true um but yeah I, I thought like her death particularly and how he kind of senses it and he's always there and the fbi guys are like we think you're up to something though like he goes in and he pulls a knife out of her like what a dumb dumb move right like, yeah like and he leaves a blood-stained stabbed. footprint behind like right? the, well the thing like everyone's death in this uh seems very realistic yeah. except for hers seems a little too just over the top because it's like yeah one thing after another after another after another leads to her dying and like like some of the things i'm going okay you you're drinking out of a cup that's spilling li- uh liquor on the floor you would feel you would think she's walking forward with it so it's like leaking onto the floor and she's walking with it right in front of her you think that it would be splashing on her shirt, on her legs, or something like that. She would be like, oh, I'm getting wet. Why is this? But <laughs> she's not. She's just walking forward, and it's just, like, spilling and spilling and spilling. And, yeah. and it's spilling a lot of booze. So it's like, how much booze is in that cup also? Like, and that's expensive. Let's also just talk about the price of that booze being spilled, right? Like, right. Come on now. 
Um, no, I agree with you. I, I, I think that one is kind of, and that's done for theatrical, right? Like yeah. we're, we're getting the experience of it, but he does seem to have a premonition about everybody, you know, stuff happening, the seatbelt, him being able to rip the seatbelt open so he can get Carter out of the car. Yeah, the reflection uh, of the bus that's not gone by yet in the window. Right. And he real oh, that when his Carter's girlfriend gets hit. Yeah, yeah, which I that one shocked snacked. me when I seen that for the first time because I didn't. Yeah, it surprised me too. It's like, yeah. oh shit! <laughs> right, you don't really see it coming. This movie's twenty one years old. Just yeah. to just to put that out there, and I think it still stands up today. Like it still is pretty entertaining. Uh, yeah, and I have to say, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, uh, please. Uh, one thing I have to say about this, like out of all the films, I feel the premonitions in this one are probably the best what, best premonitions because yeah. it's very subtle. It's not like it's not like floating in weird 3D images like we'll get into with part four. <laughs> but uh you keep rocking on part four, man. And I well, like part a four. It's not as bad as you're making it out to be. <laughs> well, it's be. not bad. Like I said, I still have fun with it, but there's just some stuff that I'm just like, oh boy. You know it was meant to be a 3D movie, right? I know. We watched with 3D glasses. And it's painfully right? obvious. <laughs> anyway, we still gotta finish a couple yes. others before we get to our part four debate. Um, I think the ending scene is great here where he, he sees clearer and clearer. She manages to outsmart death pretty good with electrical shit, right? Like she manages to kind of do, she gets in the, like, she makes a lot of smart decisions and he gets there and he says, I'll always be, there was a lot of like, you know, I'll always be with you. I got to do this, you know, and he dies, but comes back. They're able to give him CPR and he's able to be resuscitated and comes back. And we have, they finally get to Paris, um, Carter, Alex, and Clear. And they kind of have this like moment in the cafe of we're doing this for everyone that couldn't be here, which is very much something I think people would do who survive something like this. Yeah. Uh, Try to get past their fears, all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, you know, (laughs) Alex is like, what if, you know, we go back to the premonitions, which, you know, is what if we never really got out of the way? What if this was, we were supposed to be here now? What if this was supposed to happen? There's a lot of that ties back to the article. Like, what if, what if, what if, what if? And then we know that Carter gets killed by the sign and we're unsure of uh, Clear and Alex's fate. So I think for premonitions, this movie hit it on the hammer. Survivor guilt, the death scenes were cool. Some of them were more over the top than others. The characters were all well-known. I I looked up the guy, Carter, and he was in a lot of teeny bopper shows at the time. You had Devin Sawa. You had, uh, 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 what's her name? Allie Larder. Yeah, Allie Larder, yep. Um, You know, you had a lot of well-known people that were in this. Sean William Scott. Like Tony Todd. Uh, Tony Todd was great. Which, yeah, by the way, we need... Yeah, we need to bring up Tony Todd because um, my like my thoughts because for some reason they don't use him in part three and part four. Well, they do. They use his voice. Yes, but like I, but they don't bring him in as a character. But no. like I feel like he is almost like the physical manifestation of death itself. That's and, what he's supposed to be. Yeah. Yeah, like I've always felt that. Like it never really was fully explained, but it's like it's kind of like tied in there because yeah, he just seems to be there at the right time, knows all this stuff, and I just love that. It's like. He's not really the villain, but he kind of is in a way. Yeah, he just says that he's the cleaner upper of the mess, right? Like he's the one that comes in and cleans it up and kind of is like, death doesn't like to be cheated. You're right. It was almost like death was speaking through him. Yeah. Right. Um, which is really good for like the kind of good versus evil premonition kind of stuff. So did you ever think when you saw this movie, there was going to be a sequel? At the time, no. Like, I did not expect there to be a sequel. And yeah, like, um, I guess we can kind of just jump into the sequel. Yeah, let's get into it. Got a little personal story to talk about with this one. (laughs) All right. Yeah, so you know the story. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so Final Destination 2 uh, comes out on January 31st in 2003. After she has a premonition of an accident, Kimberly rushes to save the lives of the people involved. However, one by one, the survivors start dying and she realizes that her life is also at risk. Um, so before we really get into this, I'll just kind of uh, jump into my little story, because we all know part two is the famous expressway highway accident. Mm-hmm. And well, me and my buddy, we were hanging out one night and we decided to drop acid. And we were like, we were at his house in the, or in his trailer at the trailer park. And he had a neighbor down the street that we were just going to go walk over and visit because we were all fucked up and like, yeah, why not? It's late at night. Let's go over and visit this guy and, you know, just chill for a couple hours and smoke down. 
we get over there and this guy had just finished watching final destination part two and he's like oh my god i'm so glad you guys came over he's like you gotta check this shit out not knowing we're tripping on acid he decides to show us every single death in final destination two starting with the expressway fast forwards to when everybody gets picked off one by one and just just shows us the death scenes doesn't like we don't sit down and watch the whole movie he just shows us the death scenes and then he's like yeah check this out and then he puts them in slow motion like for certain death scenes <laughs> so like the little kid that gets crushed by the pane of glass yeah. you watch his body and it just you see it fold and fold and then explode into a shower gore i'm tripping on acid seeing all these images going what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and then like we finished that up and for, I would say a good six months, I could not like stop replaying those images in my head because I watched it on acid and seen just those scenes specifically. And I'm going, I need to buy this movie. It's fucked me up. I need to buy this and rewatch it because what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and and yeah. to this day, those images are like clear as day in my head. Even before, I didn't even need to watch part two for this because I'd watched it like and everything was still crystal clear but of course i had to rewatch it because i wanted to but um yeah like i just thought that was kind of funny like that just that one night of uh being fucked up and seeing those images like left images in my head for the rest of my life <laughs> but yeah 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 this one used to be my all-time favorite of the franchise um rewatching it i have a different favorite now but we'll get to that oh, later okay. okay but um yeah i really dig this one because once again like especially the whole premonition of something's wrong need to start uh, kimberly starts freaking out before she even gets on the expressway and does one of the most what i would call selfless acts ever which is throw her car sideways onto the overpass blocking anybody else from getting past her yeah she was definitely if you look at all of the ones she did the most impactful thing to stop the premonition that she saw from happening yeah because that because that premonition uh, once again like this premonition was extremely realistic and hence why we see the meme now if like the log truck driving down the road and everyone on the side of the log truck instead of behind it going yep these people have seen final destination too it's true right and i think that it was something that could happen and does happen you know i've talked about my experience on the show before getting hit by the two by four in my car uh, when i was driving on the freeway slash highway and and having glass shatter all over me and if it wasn't right. for wearing sunglasses and to this day, I have yet to understand how I kept that car in control at 110 kilometers, 20 kilometers, or whatever that is in miles, 80, 85 miles an hour, and not cause a pile up to this day. Yeah, um, I am very impressed by that. I don't know how I did that. Uh, because it was, I think I was just in shock. And maybe I thought I didn't want to make things worse. I don't know, I was able to logic it out pretty quickly, I guess. Um but yeah, it does happen. And I think her making that move shows, you know, she was probably one of the few characters that's had a premonition and really was able to do something impactful to stop it. Yes. And uh, with strangers, all complete strangers, like, and this is where we'll get into more of a debate about the fourth one. They had no interaction with each other until they went to the police station. Okay. Yep. The okay, only interaction yeah. they had with each other was the cop and Kimberly. Yes. That right? is very true. Yeah. Um, and what I thought was interesting about the second one is they reversed the order. Kimberly and her friends were supposed to die last. And she gets out of the car. She's talking to the cop. Her friends get killed. She lives. So it starts working backwards. Which, by the way, that scene is just heartbreaking. It is. And I didn't see that coming. You really think that these kids, because you get, and I'll give the writers credit. You think that these are going to be our main characters. Yeah. Right? Because of what happened in the first film. And this film takes it in a whole other direction. And the interesting thing on Kimberly's alarm clock at the beginning um, or is it alarm clock or VCR clock? It, it switches to like 180. Yes. Um, right. So, or VCR it. So when she's watching the thing about the year anniversary of flight 180. Yep, so this does also, a good job of tying into that. Yeah. But it also like when uh, they're on the expressway, she looks over and sees on the expressway sign construction on I-180 or whatever. And yeah, like there is a lot of references to flight 180 throughout all of this, which just is a perfect tie into the first film. Right. And I, I don't know why they didn't bring Devin Sawa back. Maybe he didn't want to come back. They felt that Ellie Larder would be a better character to come back. Maybe she was the one they could get. Who knows? Right. Um, but I do find it interesting that they all go back to the police station. And like, you know, they're all kind of like the cop has been the one that has done some research on this. And, and he's like, yeah, this is what happened to all these people. And like the one dude's like, this is fucking bullshit. Like this isn't a thing. And they all leave, they all peace. 
And when she has these premonitions, she doesn't know who these people are. Yeah. Like she has no idea. Like the guy that won the lottery, there's no way she could have fucking prevented what happened to him. Right. Well, um, that's the one thing on this one too. Like I, um, like with her premonitions, the clues are just so vague. Like, mm-hmm. you, like that she, cause she just, uh, in this one, she gets images like that just she almost has like these weird like flashbacks images playing in her mind mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. not like little clues like in the like out in the world like uh Devin Sawa's character scene it's just like yeah these just flash in her head and like they are just so vague like it's like for movie's sake obviously she, she's able to put some of them together but like every one of them like she's either wrong or like goes to the wrong person or something happens like and it doesn't save anybody because yeah the images are just so vague to her and I think it's different from the first one where it was all people that Alex had access to or knew. Yes. He knew in some shape or form. She doesn't know who any of these fucking people are. Like they basically met at the police station and then they fucking peaced, right? So I think that him dying, the lottery winner dying first are- Oh my God. <laughs> it's, that's a great scene. Like, and the, and the chick's calling him and stuff. Like it's, it's really well done. And what gets him, like she sees eye or something like that. Oh no, you see eye on the fridge. Yes. Um, right. That we all have small little premonitions, which Ali Lard's character talks about later. There's signs that we can all see that something is amiss, right? And we, that article talked about that as having that feeling, or we talked about that. Today's not a good idea for me to go do this. Today's, you know, I'm not feeling right about doing this right now. You know, I don't think it's a good idea for me to go do this thing. Right. And, and I, this movie really plays on that. Yeah. And I wanted to bring up the lottery winner because two, uh, for one, he gets in the while he's while they're at the police station, they bring up how he's lucky. Like he was lucky. He won the lottery. Mm-hmm. And then this woman saved his life on this expressway where that would killed him shortly after he got his money. Yep. And then you see all this shit happening to him. Like once again, this one goes over the top with like his, especially kind of like the teachers where it's just like one thing after another, after another. Yeah. But I think in this one, it was just playing off the whole, this, this, this guy just keeps getting lucky, keeps getting lucky. Like, yeah. Cause you know, the yeah. whole, uh, yeah, I think microwave. you're right. The whole luck premonition, like the microwave, like he manages to get out of the apartment. This guy against all odds manages to get out of this fucking apartment before. After like up. so many different things happen right? to stop him. Yeah. Like it was like, he was out smarting death, out smarting death, out smarting death. And then he didn't. Right. Yep. Um, and I really like that with this character. Cause like, like it yeah. obviously, and it paid, uh, and it, I just liked it. Cause it was like, this guy is obviously a nasty ass slob. Cause his apartment was disgusting. Yeah. And because of that causes a lot of the issues at that apartment in that apartment that almost kill him because he like accidentally throws something and catches his trash on fire. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. falls in his possibly rotten rice that he's getting ready to throw in the microwave. Oh man, that just... stuff was fucking gross, right? Yeah. But, no, you're right. And I think that, you know, and then she goes back to clear and clears like, fuck you. I don't want anything to do with you. And I think Which that's I don't blame her. <laughs> relevant of how a survivor would feel and how like standoffish she is. And they explain what happened with Alex and stuff. Um, I do like how the cop does believe her and they kind of work together to establish what's going to happen. She knows that something's going to happen to Tim and they're able to kind of track her and him down. I forget how they track down the mother and the son. Yeah, they like, use the uh, cop, right? Yeah, the cop's say, able the, to do it. Yeah, because the cop is like the key to this movie to find yeah. the people because he has access to a lot to the of the information, stuff. right? Yeah, so yeah, I forget exactly how they were able to figure out that Tim was at a dentist appointment and something about pigeons were going to be the cause of the death. Right. And yeah, once again, like this one definitely goes over the top with like death trying multiple times to... Yes kill him and force them into a spot where it actually wants them to be yeah the dentist scene is great a lot of people have phobias about going to the dentist anyway mm-hmm. and then that fish thing drops into his mouth and then the pigeons she sees pigeons and the pigeons uh you know the glass falls on him which is a great scene yeah, which like is it's the a scene really that really good scene. for me and oh my <laughs> it's a very squish squish scene and the mother's reaction is very legit and of course the cop, you know, you know, we're, for, we're, you know, understanding that he gets together all these people and is like, Hey, this, and this has happened. They all meet at his apartment. The kayak falls at one point and Allie Lard is like, I should have seen that coming. Mm-hmm, like yeah. there's just, and there's a lot of discussion about these little signs that lead up to it. And I think that that ties into the premonition stuff from the article that we talked about. And I think they did a good job for a group of people, not knowing each other coming together for a common goal and then getting connected through traumatic things that happen. So even that one guy who doesn't believe them, the professor, 
goes to leave with the Nora, Tim's mom, and yep. then, like a guy with hooks, hooks, and like the fucking claw things that that guy's holding, and she gets stuck in the elevator and dies. Like it's it's, and that causes them all to want to believe in each other now, right? And they all kind of like stick together for the rest of it until they all get knocked off slowly. Right. Um, like, uh, during that scene too, like uh, that's when you can uh, when you learn that uh, Kimberly is like, you know, everybody if they are open to it can have these premonitions well that's what clear see. says yeah, oh, was, clear okay, says clear. That. Okay. yeah clear says that yeah and uh then the druggy party dude like sees the hooks and everything in the, the closet and that's how they're like that's how he puts it man. together that's right right and um i think it's interesting because not all of them have premonitions where you see coming like when the woman's in the car wreck the one with the dark hair oh yeah and the jaws of life are trying to get her out and it blows up the airbag which puts her head through the pipe that well, there was no premonitions to that. It was almost like death, death, death. Like you see the one guy get hit from the barbed wire that goes flying. Yep, there was no premonition for him. No either. premonition for that. No premonition for her. Um, the one gentleman has his lungs punctured and ends up in the hospital. Who I guess he died later on, which is why he just got injured and got sent to the hospital. Yeah, because he so, gets uh, because yeah, he explodes later. He explodes later, yeah, in the explosion. So there were some things where premonitions weren't as like there was like bang bang death death death. Okay, a little bit more plot development. There's this woman who we think is going to have new life can, you know, stop death. So if this woman wasn't supposed to live and has the baby, then it completely changes death design death plan. The idea of like divine intervention. And then they find out she was never meant to die in the crash anyway, right? Yep. And, and we, um, yeah, sorry. So I was like, like uh, during that car accident too, I meant to bring up too, this is where they tie it all back to the first one where um, the cop was uh, over, like had gotten distracted and almost died, but ended up getting called to the train accident in the first movie. Right. And like each person was connected to one of the accidents in the first film. Yes. That where they would have died if something didn't prevent that from happening. So it's almost like death had missed him the first time, yeah. came back from a second time, missed him again. And now he's trying to get him one by one. And I think what was smart about this sequel is it was a true sequel. You definitely had to see the first movie to get the second movie to the yep. full extent of what the movie was about. Yeah, because you could watch um, this as a one-off, but like you wouldn't get a lot of the references. You wouldn't, right? So it was it was very well done for that. It was very impressive that they did that. Uh, but we see a similar of like Kimberly having these premonitions and they're kind of always like two seconds too late. She has them in like, oh no, stop. And like something happens, right? Yep. <laughs> um, and then when she attempts to, I guess, kill herself or not, yeah, kill herself basically um you know and she gets brought back then we have the ending scene where like her and the cop go to this family's house which is uh, such a weird ending like i don't know who wrote this ending that they're all going to show up at this family that they met briefly when they ran onto their lawn um and had a barbecue but yeah, well, i was like because i think they invited him over because they saw because the uh one of them saved the kid's life from the Yeah, but the explosion. one they saved the kid's life was dead. Right. So I think they just said, oh, yeah, just a group. Like, it still doesn't make any sense. But yeah. like, I think that's the only connection to why they were invited to that cookout or barbecue. Sorry. Yeah, whatever. And for Michigan standards, <laughs> they were all like barbecue. And then the kid dies because <laughs> propane blows up. Um, and it, obviously, Kimberly didn't see that coming. There was no premonition for that. Right. They just realized in the order that the kid was supposed to die, got saved by the stoner. So like this kind of follows the same formula as the first movie, but also changes it up a little bit, but makes a lot more, more uh, references to the first movie where moving forward, the formula is followed very similar for three, four and five, I think. Yeah, well, the formula changes a bit with part five, like just with something that uh, is brought up in the storyline. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But there's still that. Well, not really, because it's the idea of a, yeah, we'll get to it. We'll yeah. get to So then this one, it was new life and it changes the design. If someone was supposed to die, but they bring a new life into it. It changes death the signs. It, it changes the future and people can all live. But it a enjoyable movie. I, I really like Final Destination 1 and 2 together. I think they're yeah. a very good pairing. Yeah, well, and I think it's a great trilogy with the next one like coming up because I also really like part three. Absolutely, but they kind of stop connecting to each other as strongly. Besides, yeah, when it flight one eighty being mentioned in every single film, yeah, um, right. right. But let's get to three. All right. So, Final Destination three was released February tenth on two thousand and six. Wendy saves her friends' lives when she has a premonition that the roller coaster they are about to get on will crash. However, each person in the group starts to die in horrifying ways. And yep, this one 
also kind of like part two for me hit on that fear of roller coasters because i i love roller coasters but i also have an absolute fear of heights so mm-hmm. like there's certain ones that i just won't get on because my chicken shit ass just too scared to do it unless i get convinced into doing it i won't ever do it um and this just kind of established my fears because this one also felt pretty realistic with how it all happened. Obviously, like chain of events that caused this, you know, we'll see. But uh, all in all, though, I really like this one, especially because we have uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as a wonder, I believe might be her first film debut as uh, Wendy. And I thought she did a great job in this, but this one also has a lot of recognizable actors in it because uh, one of the other characters in this is also uh the boyfriend in ginger uh ginger snaps yeah yeah and he's one of my favorite characters in this uh in this movie but uh yeah this one yeah she saves people from uh certain death just from this horrific uh roller coaster accident and uh this one is where it gets kind of a little more cgi-ish yeah you can see a lot more which you know doesn't bother me nearly as bad anymore but uh yeah, like the deaths in this one are pretty interesting. Like, I don't know if, if you have anything else, anything you want to add to like the roller coaster stuff first. Uh, the roller coaster is my favorite, favorite death in the entire series. Really? Yeah, it's nice. absolutely my favorite. I think that it uh, capitalized on everybody's fear of going on a roller coaster and what could happen. Uh, it was filmed at Playland in Vancouver. So that's a real roller coaster. The actual name of the roller coaster is the Corkscrew. For any of our people on the West Coast that maybe want to one day ride the uh, the same roller coaster that was used in Final Destination, it is still in operation. Um, and they just obviously did it up to make it like the Devil's Heath or whatever it's called, right. or whatever. Make or, it even more foreboding, yeah, right? Make it all more creepy. Um, oh, Devil's Flight. That's what it's called. Yeah, Devil's, Devil's Flight. Flight yeah. Right. I I think it's very her freak out is something that I've seen at amusement parks. And I've seen people freak out, hyperventilate, get off rides. And sometimes they don't let you off the ride. But in this case, she was making such a fucking mess that they let her off. And they would, they would just let off the back carts. They would be like, too bad you guys have to get off. Um, Maybe not everybody, but if like, they would have to, when you, when you raise it, you race all the bars in that one cart. Like that's actually how the mechanics of works. Right. Um, So I could see people getting off if this one person was freaking out. I thought that was really clever. And of course, no one believes her. The ride happens. And what I felt I did not like about this one, where I found the first one was better. It was like everyone besides Wendy and her boyfriend were like, oh, well, our friends died. Like, now move on. Like there was, it was all high school seniors that were supposed to be at this thing. And everyone acted like it was no big fucking deal. Like three weeks later, we're not even at graduation yet. This was supposed to be like their graduation carnival. So, you know, I'm assuming it's like a couple of weeks, maybe a month later, because the July 4th celebration happens. Mm -hmm. Um, They're all like chilling. Yeah, like, um, and one thing I, one thing I had an issue with, like, uh, kind of going back a little bit was uh, when, you know, uh, she, when Wendy's freaking out and they let her off the thing, like, the one, the boyfriend is all the way up front. And he's like, dude, let me off. That's my girlfriend freaking out. And they wouldn't even let him off. And I'm going, okay, come on. Like, I, I believe that he wouldn't be let off, though. I was like, like I, I mean, I, I believe it too. But at the same time, I'm just like, oh, God, what fucking assholes. I was, I was kind of pissed. They wouldn't right? let him off. Right. But I think that, you know, I, in the like, there's a theme park out here that we I go to frequently enough, and it has some big coasters and stuff, and people freak out like that. Like it's they get scared. I know I wanted to get scared too and get off mm-hmm. some fucking rides, um, but like I could see them being like too bad. Like it's you'll be done in fucking three minutes. Like right, they didn't think what was going to happen was going to happen, right? right? And I find this scene very very well done with the CGI for the coaster. I I think they used enough personally for like 2006. I think it's well done. Yeah. Like, I I mean, you can just, you notice there's CGI, but it's not like, oh, this is glaring and painful and like, well, like and how's he going to do it? Right. Like, yeah, it seemed I mean, like that. There's no yeah, other there's way. There's no you're way. Actually, you have to do, you have to do it. actually collapse, right? <laughs> yeah. You have to do it this right. way. <laughs> right. So I think now in this case, Wendy does go back to having the premonitions with those, with the help of the camera. And they tie in uh, Aber- Abraham, um, yeah, Lincoln's death uh, oh, with, yeah. is it Lincoln, right? Yep, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln. I almost said, I was like, Ram Man. Ram Man. I'm like, no, Ram Man's still alive and well. No. Oh, no, we're having a premonition right oh now. God, Ram, Man's Ram Man. No, no, don't go on any roller coasters, Ram Man. Don't do it. <laughs> um, but 
so they have the picture with like the line across his head where he got shot and then the reflection of the plane in the in the world trade center towers and then she's looking at the pictures and it's showing like the fire for where the ashley's who get uh Oh, get burned to death which is a great scene those young ladies play a very ditzy like oh my god girls really well like <laughs> i don't i love their uh like when they see uh wendy walking in the rain and they're going oh, we should totally like ask her to join us because that's like so nice of us to do right? <laughs> i just love that like they totally played those types of girls like perfectly <laughs> but they weren't complete dicks right no like, they were they just were ditzy just- ditzy and like kind of self-absorbed and you know props to them for doing the topless scenes that were required for this film yeah and i thought they're like everything was a perfect set of events and when she calls them and she says sorry i was too late yes like what a good line and and she kind of puts it together after they die what the pictures meant right so she had that premonition about the ride before and then she starts to put together that the pictures are meaning something the Kevin has already put in her mind that about the 180 and the survivors and the sufferings death afterwards. It's a really good setup. And then <laughs> that one dude, Frankie, they can't figure out how to find him. And then they end up being in the drive through line behind <laughs> him. The freaking creeper. <laughs> right. And he ends up getting, what is it like? What goes through his head? The engine block goes flying the through, his, goes head through and, like, his head. Fucking right? The fan chops him in half, which... I got to bring this up. Um, I don't know if you ever watched the DVD, but the DVD has almost like a choose your own adventure feature on it to where uh, when certain decisions need to be made, you can click, does the character do this or not? And mm-hmm. they give you a different scene depending on what happens. So like there was one with uh, Frankie where he actually survives the movie. Like, Oh, really? After, like he doesn't show back up in the movie after this, but like you, like there was an option that you could choose. And if you chose the right option, like the truck, had an accident but frankie got out of it and then you just never seen him the rest of the movie but yeah then like or the other option happens and the fan flies through and chops his end pieces but yeah there was like these weird like choose your own adventure options on part three that made it very fun and interactive like on the well DVD. and that kind of allows you to do the premonition thing yourself right yeah. and, and control of destiny which is really what all these movies are seeking for is control of your destiny and that fear that you don't have control over what's going to happen i do love how they have tony tony todd doing the operation voice for the ride in the subway yes on this on this film and um, um what was the uh bodybuilder guy's name the one that worked out in the gym because like i really liked his uh scene i think his name was lewis yes lewis yeah because yeah, he was the one that's just like fuck you, I don't believe any of this bullshit. You know, you have at least one of those in each one of the uh, movies. Always, right? And he's like working out in this gym and and he avoids death once. And he's like, well, I guess it's not that my time to die. And this happens in the later films. This happens in the third one mm-hmm. and also in the fourth one a couple of times. And and then his head gets squished by the weights. Which and- yeah, he didn't, like that was just hilarious. Like, oh, f- I'm not afraid of death. I defeated death. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the first one where there's no real police intervention though there isn't like the cops in the second one throughout the entire thing so i guess we kind of just like well the cops there yeah. so but there's no official police intervention in that one nor is there really in this one like they watch um, this guy get squished by a, a fucking weight we don't see them get questioned at all of why were you here why were you telling him something was going to happen and then something happens and they like get in their car and they're like wow that was really tough do you want to go get some snacks like it right. was- <laughs> like there's there is one time where the police are involved, but they're like not actual characters on the screen. Cause uh, I don't oh, remember. Yeah. Like who's... in the accident at the drive through, they're there. Yes. Yeah. Cause they ended up, uh, cause the, the, the guy that's with her, he's just like, Oh, that was 10 hours of uh, interrogation. I'm glad that's over with or whatever. Oh, but that was at the end of it. That was after, that was after someone else's death. Yeah. I was trying to remember whose death that was. Cause yeah, I, I, so remember I the death believe that was after when they went to visit them at work. So oh, I think yes. finally what has happened is they go to visit that couple at work and they're trying yep. to convince that gothy couple that shit's going to go down yep, and that's my favorite character the gothy guy right uh ian mckinley yes and then who's played by chris lamech who was in you know a couple of different movies yep he was in um, ginger snaps if i'm remembering correctly i yes he was in gin- he was sam and ginger ginger snaps um so yeah like it's it's <laughs> Yeah, by that point, they get questioned because they've gone for these premonitions and she's trying to like warn everybody like she finds and that's what makes more sense that she knows who these people are. She knows that, you know, Lewis likes to work out and he's going to be training. She knows that 
these two people, this couple works at this hardware store. So that I did like that the premonitions were kind of making more sense because she could go connect with them and find out where they were. And it was a unique idea with the pictures, like using them yes. to kind of like, cause she still didn't know what exactly was going to happen or where it was going to happen. Mm-hmm. And most time, like, just like a lot of these movies, she figures out the premonition way too late and pieces it together right after it already happens. Sometimes she catches it in advance, but like in this one, she catches that it's like while they're in the warehouse, she catches what the premonition is, but it's still too late because it's, it's yeah. already in motion at the point. Better than Kimberly in the second one that was like, oh my God, you're going to die. And like two seconds later, it happens. Like, I feel like there was a little bit more of a lead up time here. The most lead up time was in the first one, I found, right? Um, It seemed like Alex had the strongest sense, I guess you could say. And it kind of just varied. Uh, And the fourth one, actually, the one character or the main character there had a pretty strong sense of things and was able to avoid a couple of situations. But so they saved Ian. And then still like, my favorite is like, Kevin's like, shit's going down, but I'm going to go work security guard at July 4th fireworks. Right. Like this seems like a good idea. <laughs> like It's just so fucking fitting. But, and that whole scene, she finds out that her sister was on, she has all these pictures from the yearbook and that she was on the yearbook committee as she sees that her sister was next. And that whole series of events that are happening. Right. So they have the prep. She has not really the premonitions anymore. She just looks at the pictures. Yeah. which I think is different, right? She's not visioning anything anymore. She's looking at the pictures and putting the information of the pictures together, which yeah. is different from Kimberly or um, Alex from the first two. Yes. Like, yeah, because like, she's not getting no crazy images in her head or anything like that. It's all, which I think um, part one and part three, I like the way the premonitions are done. Yeah. Because part one's subtle and part three is just something different that's not like something just weird flashing in their heads. Well, you could argue they're not premonitions. It's just she had the one premonition and now she's getting just putting hints. it together, right? Getting hints from the pictures. Anyway, they survive, uh, long story short. And subway scene happens. Well, we got to bring up uh, the whole McKinley thing. You Okay, I... Okay. Because I, I just like that where it's like uh, somehow Ian McKinley ends up being the reason for Wendy's death. Mm-hmm. And so, which kind of in a way ties to part five. Yeah. Like what's, what can, what starts end up happening storyline wise. Yeah. But like uh, Ian, like I, like he's just, you know, completely distraught by his girlfriend dying and finally mm-hmm. believes what's going on with Wendy. So he's like, well, fuck this. I'm going to kill Wendy because if she's dead, then death will be done. Well, death's design will be over with. And well, that doesn't happen, and he gets fucking flattened by that giant metal sign in such a gruesome way. But like, I just like that interaction where they see him, and he's just like, "Oh no, you're not getting away from me," you know. And like, and then once again, that line of, "Oh, I guess it just wasn't my time." When the rockets explode, and like they just miss him, and he's like, "See, I guess it wasn't my time." And then the sign comes down and crushes him. I yeah, like that. Yeah, I I agree. I I do like that scene. I just find that that whole scene is like death 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 there's no premonition stuff right like she's just like i think you're gonna cause my death and i don't know how so you just need to stay away from me yeah right there's none like where in other ones it was like this is probably what's gonna happen so you need to stay away from me right um and then she has her final premonition on the subway which is just uh i like the writing of of that final scene i think all of it like her sister comes into town early uh kevin happens to be there checking out a ball game and they all yeah. happen to be on the subway at the same time and she ends up hearing the same song being played that she heard throughout the movie and it's just like oh shit. yeah there's certain songs in each film that seem to be the trail mark of like something happening and yeah. i think that's really clever and i do enjoy tony todd it's the end of the line the end of the line i really good like no matter what death is going to find you and this is how it's going to happen so yeah now let's go to the one that scott keeps throwing shade on uh all right scotty bring in the shade all right the final destination also known as final destination Four, august 28th 2009 While watching a car race at a stadium with his friends, Nick has a premonition of a car crash which kills all the audience. However, he manages to save his friends, but how long can he cheat death? All right, so the main issue I have with this one, right, I'm just going to get it out off my chest right now, is just the, look, it's 3D. Like, it's the most 3D (laughs) movie that 3D ever created. Like everything is literally thrown at the screen. It's not the subtle 3D that we later get with like, I think, because I think part five might've used 3D and it was a lot more subtle. 
it wasn't just like here's a tire flying directly at the screen here's these mm -hmm. floating images flying right at your face like mm -hmm. how a lot of the cheesy 3d back in the day was like i mean i gotta if i'm gonna knock it i gotta knock part three of fi uh, friday the 13th because of that too because it did the same thing oh here's an eyeball popping right up at the screen do, 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 do. <laughs> it's just watching it when it's not i bet it was cool to watch it in 3d i'll give it that but mm -hmm. watching it without 3d it's just like ugh, this is so ridiculous but um that is just like my big gripe around the whole film of that like i'll get into little complaints later that you can hate me for later <laughs> i you're allowed to have your a completely wrong opinion scott wow, like damn. <laughs> just kidding um the final destination clearly this was supposed to be the last one and yeah. i think because of the uh, lacklusterness that is part of this one is the reason why it's not now it is the currently the highest grossing final destination film holy shit really yeah um that, that's impressive it cost 40 million to make and it made 186 million wow they all made huge money oh, they I all bet. cost not a lot of money to make comparably to how much money they brought in which is hence why we have five of them yeah. um i think this one though did hurt the prospects of their of number five it'll be interesting we get to number five and see how much money it made because I think this one probably disappointed people. Yep. Yeah, well, um, it wasn't as good as the first three. No, and I have to say, um, the accident in this, which once again, fairly believable. Um, but this one, I feel it just almost felt like it was just part two all over again, except, you know, not an expressway, like with the whole major accident, because it's obviously the cars being involved, wrecks happening, causing people's death. The difference being obviously the stadium being like completely in disrepair and old and falling apart, which like with yeah, the giant I, chunks I, falling, I think that's like the major difference. But I, I don't, I, don't, I just get this vibe that it just felt too well, much. Well, same director. Just, yeah, I know. So that's why I say I was disappointed. <laughs> right. I I think that this one. Nick's premonition, it starts off very quick, right? They're at the mm -hmm. racetrack. There's no buildup of them going to the racetrack. We're just at the racetrack. And he has this premonition of what's going to happen, all these things that are happening around him. And he realizes it, panics. And because he already in his head had these interactions with these other people, he's able to get everyone out through things that he does. And there's kind of a small group of them that gather outside and the one guy's girlfriend gets killed by a flying tire, which I think is pretty funny because Nick's like, there's going to be an accident. What accident? There's accidents all the time. And this chick gets smacked by a tire. Which I got to say right now, uh, that is one thing I do like about this one is how Nick is able to be like, all right, this guy's going to say this right now. That chick's going to put tampons in her kid's ears right now. And yeah. like, like that that is like a great way to convince people that are not that just thinking you're crazy to get the fuck out well, of well it shows some premonitions right yeah. like it shows that he's truly had a premonition he's predicting things before they happen and you know the rest of the stuff that happens like the racist guy that goes to george's house to kill him <laughs> the way over the top like, and the song of why can't we be friends and the tow truck dragging him like it's it's very interesting now i don't i can't remember what alex's not alex's sorry nick's premonition was for that one um that one was um uh cross something on fire oh that was the that was a tow truck yep right right so he does have these visions which i think the, is you're alluding to of the uh, the cheesy stuff because it's yeah, all it's 3d just, is right yeah, it's like well and it's just weird like floating image float and it's almost like like obviously flying at you because of the 3d but it just kind of like without the 3D, it's just like, this is just so silly. Like, yeah. Of all the premonition, like the way this guy gets the senses of people's deaths, this is probably the silliest of them all, which yeah. is not to take away yeah. from it. I just think it's sillier. I think that's a valid bad. point. I think images would make sense that you would see images. I think it's how they chose to show the images. Yes. That made it, that made it silly, right? So, and then the i thought the interactions though like samantha the mom taking her two boys to get their hair cut like i thought all the little skits of where people died were actually really good like i found yeah, that I, I thought the deaths were good too like i felt bad for the mom like there was a couple of characters throughout it like the mom in the in the second one and her son i felt bad for and i felt bad for the mom here yeah like i felt bad that her kids had to watch her i got my eye on you and then like <laughs> it shoots through right and i i thought that it was it was really well done um nick eventually becomes 
you know, he, he connects this back to, of course, it all go back to flight 180 and he connects it back to the speed race station or what the not speed race station where we went for the race. He goes back there and he's trying to kind of like connect all the dots. Mm-hmm. And I thought what was really interesting about this is that George tries to kill himself and he can't. Yeah. That's the same with the uh, guy in part two. Right. Uh, that didn't believe. And he goes upstairs and goes to pull the trigger on himself. And the, yes, we forgot the gun about never went off. Right, which really goes on that, or no, the gun goes off, click, 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 and none of the bullets come out, and yes. six bullets, it's fully loaded. Yeah. So the same with this here, George tries multiple ways to kill himself, none of it works, because that's not death's the sign. You Like, death's the sign is now you've skipped death, and now death is going to come for you when it's damn well ready to, and it's going in this specific order. So I do enjoy that part of the premonition piece. I think my other scene that I really enjoy here is the mall scene. I enjoy the yeah, buildup I... where they think that they have managed to beat it because they managed to stop the one girl from dying in the car wash, which was a really good. It was good. But wow. Like that one was crazy. Like to have that, like to drown in your own car, who would have fucking thought. Right. And I do love where George comes through with the car at the last minute and like yes. pushes the car back and the douchebag at the fucking pool, banging the chick in the tent. And then, <laughs> his, oh man, thank God. Dad. Such a, he played such a douchebag really well. And then like getting his inside sucked out of him. Sucked there are situations where that has happened. Like you can get like, that's not far off. No, right? and I, so, and I, but it cra- like of all the people to have that happen to, and it's after he lost his lucky coin. Yes. That, and that was the reason he went down there to get to, like, once again, luck being uh, not a factor in this movie. Like, well, luck being a factor to an extent, but eventually death is going to kick your ass. Right. And then just even the little things like, you know, Nick trying to reach him, but it goes to voicemail or he misses the call. Like, it's all death inter interfering so that these things are going to happen and alex has these premonitions of clear water so not alex i keep messing up the names yeah, nick. nick uh so nick is driving and he calls him up to stay away from anything Actually, water clear rivers clear the, river which i which was a nice throwback oh, to the first movie that is a nice little throwback right so yeah so there's little cool things that nick does have a little bit more of a kind of a lead up time for all this stuff that's going to happen i find that there's like he he sees it and then he's able to go warn them uh, the mechanic guy's death was really <laughs> brutal oh, too. Yeah, that one was pretty uh, going like pretty much getting slammed right into the fucking chain link fence and getting pretty much turned into the guy from uh, Resident Evil. <laughs> yeah, right. Cubed. So the ending scene at the mall. So they've saved Kimberly's friend, or is it Kimberly or Lori? I'm messing up their names now. There's I think it's Lori. Lori, and yeah, Janet. Kimberly was. So the they've character. saved. So Lori and Janet go to the mall to see a movie. They're watching the movie. Uh, Lori gets some bad vibes about some shit going on. I love how Janet's like, I'm going to stay and watch this movie and there's an explosion and then the explosion happens in the theater. Yep. This whole third act, I really do enjoy the shit out of. Yeah. The third act in this one, I think is the most intense. Like it's, it's very intense and the, the fire at the mall's intense. What he sees is intense. And and it's weird because he knows George is going to get hit. So this all starts off with George getting hit by the ambulance. And when he comes out of the premonition, he's like, George. And then it's like too late. Yeah. Right. Which uh, and- we do got to tie in the, uh, after that, you know, like when they realize, oh, yeah, we're, we're done with Death Design or whatever we saved. They forget about the cowboy that yes, they that didn't realize. Was, and he was in the hospital just basically on life support. And he ends up getting killed. And that's what kind of restarts it all back up again. And that's when they realize they're fucked. Because they don't even, I don't even think they interact with the cowboy. Because it's just, it goes to a scene of him going, showing him he's alive. And then he's dead. Well, yeah, they never, because they never get there in time. Right? Yeah. The flooding happens and all that other shit. So it's it's really cool. And then how he avoids the fire at the uh, the mall. Oh, yeah. But and I then like, the shit mm-hmm. that happens, the death toys with him while he's trying to stop it. Yes. Like, this is where I think death is, like, having a little more fun with the characters. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not just, like, because this one is, like, okay, you can definitely tell there's something supernatural really going on here. Like, some of the other ones have, like, supernatural, but this one was very heavily played on the supernatural aspect of it. And which I like and don't like at the same time in this movie. But at the same time, like, it's still made of fun. And he manages to save himself, Lori and Janet. And then the coffee scene at the end, right? He goes in, they're like, sees that homeless guy that's like oh yeah you saved all those people and then he's sitting there we go back to premonitions we're back at a cafe again and it's like 
what if we were supposed to be here? Like, what if everything has come down to this moment? And that's yep. when the car comes through. The old semi truck and it goes to this like weird, cool x-ray sh- vision right. of killing the characters. Showing that yet again, death the sign is always going to get you. All these movies kind of end the same, except for the second one. You do not know the fate of yeah. Kimberly and the cop. Yep, they are the only two. Yeah, yeah, they, they are literally the only two because we didn't know the fate of Clear or uh, Alex in the, at the end of part one. Yeah, but, but then, they tie it up with part two. Right. But yeah, so, like, yeah, Kimberly and the cop never get brought back up or tied back in. So we have no idea what happens with them. All right. For every other movie, you know what happens. Yeah. You know that they don't make it, right? Spoiler. Um, but I guess you would know since we've listened, talked to all four right now, and we just got to get to the last one. So I'm pretty sure this was supposed to be the final destination, but I think because of the 3D, I think uh, people were disappointed like you were. And I think that's why they came out with the next one. Which, all right. So the next one is Final Destination 5, which was released August 4th, 2011. 10 years ago. That's crazy. It does not feel like it's been 10 years. But I will say it right now, after re-watching them all, this is my favorite of the entire franchise. Really? Yeah, I loved this one. Um, but I'll get into the synopsis real quick. Pre- a premonition helps Sam and his colleagues escape a fatal accident. Death, however, is not quite ready to part with its victims and decides to come after them. Um, the reason I like this one a lot more is I think I just like all the characters in this one. Like, they are all unique and not over the top asshole-ish like you don't always have like that one asshole character well, they're not like, teenagers yes they're not teenagers they're all this like, is the first time we're looking at adults being like yeah, mid-20s true. yeah now mind you in the second one the secondary characters were not adult were adults no. but kimberly was a college student yeah you know at the at in the third and the the first and the third it was high school students yep, seniors, seniors. And then on the fourth one, you get the impression that they're just on college or maybe on their summer break, like they're early 20 year olds. They're young. These guys, you feel like they're a little more established. Yeah, well, and they're all like in careers, like, right? like this is a huge business trip they're getting ready to go on, yeah. which what I like about this one, um, this one seems to focus a lot more on character building before the premonition actually starts yes because you get a lot of like character building and the acting's probably better like the first one and the second one have the best acting followed by the third followed by the fourth yes yeah because i was just really impressed by the fact that it takes like almost 20 minutes or so before we even get to the main premonition incident yeah. And it's just all like character development of introducing each character individually. And once again, these characters all know each other through work or work related things. The main character, uh, what's his name? Sam is like, doesn't even work with the company, but he is just like a professional cook that was hired on by his friend to pretty much go with them on this business trip to cook. Uh, but I like this one because this is also another good fear that people have. And that is fear of no he he did work for the company he worked there during the day and he was a chef at night oh that's right yeah okay yeah Yeah, that was his like day job and then he was moonlighting as a chef right because that was his dream job was to be a chef working in like a sous chef yeah he was a line cook yep like at a nice restaurant but he was yeah he was working at a very fancy place yeah yeah but um yeah i like this one uh a, a lot obviously but uh like this one once again has that uh plays on the fear because suspension bridges i know a lot of people that are terrified of going over these bridges because it's just over these giant bodies of water and like especially like uh because we have a bridge like that here and it's the Mackinac bridge and when you go over it it, like your speeds have to drop and everything depending on if it's like a windy day like you can Mm -hmm. feel the bridge swaying and Mm -hmm. like it's Mm -hmm. it's kind of nerve-wracking for some people like any bridges can be for sure i've always thought of bridges collapsing we actually had a bridge collapse near me back in the early uh 1930s oh really mm-hmm. oh, mm-hmm. boy yeah, it was a it was a driving bridge too and it collapsed oh wow yeah yeah that'd be terrifying and right yeah this film does like it's felt very realistic with how it would happen like with like, the construction being done on there and like it's yeah it's just like this one made me like anxious kind of like two three and five just gave me that like feeling of anxiety during the major accident that's happening absolutely and the characters are very <sighs> 
like you do get connected to them you're right and when he's and when he has a premonition and it's dust in the wind is the song yes. that's playing and which is like a song about death all we are is dust in the wind mm-hmm. uh and he manages like he's like when he sees it he's like we need to get off the bus now and it's interesting the people who get off the bus and why right they're like what are you doing and that that 10 second head start that a couple of the characters get by just getting off the bus like olivia manages not to panic she doesn't lose her glasses uh other people are just off so they're easy to run to get to safety as the bridge starts collapsing Next. and the cgi is great like yeah you know i'm reading on here that the critics praised the C- cgi in this film compared to the other films um i think the cgi in three is fine for when it came out i think the mm-hmm. cgi in this one shows what could be done in the future and i can imagine if they make a six one yeah. how well the cgi can be done yeah, and like the, that is one thing too about this major accident too is uh yeah this one it's not like you know every one of them they've been by just mere seconds or minutes from death actually happening, but this one it's like they're actually having to run for their lives because the accident is still happening around them. They weren't yeah they weren't at the safety's edge like the other ones. No yeah they were still right. in it. And had, like if they would have not ran like or ran fast enough, they would have still not made it. Yeah. Which yeah. is still it's just crazy to me that that's how that one happened. It's like oh shit get off the bus. Oh it's happening right now. Go. Yeah. Like he kind of gave them a 10 second head start. That's yeah. basically what happened, right? Um, and of course the FBI questions him similar to the first one that makes sense. Like, how did you know this was going to happen? Yeah. And uh, then the research comes back that, you know, the bridge just collapsed due to structural issues. It had nothing to do with him planting a bomb or anything like that, which is what the FBI is wondering if he had something to do with it. Um, I do find that the buildup to the deaths here is it's a lot quicker, uh, kind of not like Candace dies during her gym practice. And that gym scene is painful to watch, oh. uh, and a very good buildup. And I'm just wondering why the equipment wasn't better well kept, but that could be said did. for almost any one of these movies though. Right? But he doesn't have our main character. Sam doesn't have a premonition about Candace dying. Yeah, I don't think he really has many any premonitions. premonitions of any of them. Really. I think he just realizes the order of what's happening once like a couple of them die. Yeah. So he starts like just trying to be like near them to protect them. So but, really, like, yeah, this one is more based on the spectacularness of the deaths and things that could like the gymnast, the spa, uh, the eye surgery none yeah. of it really is him sensing it it's just the order of where people died in his premonition yep and um i like uh the because this is where like even the asshole character doesn't become the asshole character till eight later on in the movie because what happens to his girlfriend candace like because mm-hmm. you, you're just like oh he's just like a dude that's you know trying to vie for power in the company and try to get it get go places and you know he really loves his girlfriend he's good friends with everybody and then like what happens to his girlfriend just completely devastates him and destroys him and like to the point where he he just you know starts drinking heavily and just like starts kind of just losing his temper and then we find out the whole because tony todd reappears after the spa one which uh this is the one character where it's like hey like i seen this ca- i can't remember his name the one that goes to the spa but he's like the douchebag oh isaac isaac like uh i was almost gonna be like hey that's smoke show in movie form like when he's on the bus and he's like oh talking to this one lady then he's like oh, i gotta let you go and another lady calls he starts talking to her I'm yeah, like, hey, that's right? smoke show <laughs> yeah he was funny isaac that's that's totally you scott you are just constantly on the phone with bitches i don't even know how we managed to record all the, podcast. Time. All, all the time all the time all the time it's i have to schedule you in just for this podcast i, I know, said you were just... busy at a memorial barbecue no 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 you're just like beer you know those cheap phone lines that you call on a friday night where there's this chick <laughs> that's like i'm home tonight looking to talk that's you um, yep. that's what you do you're just available hey, to talk all the time <laughs> give you my sultry voice Ooh, yeah. <laughs> You but like I just that. realized as we're talking, there's no premonitions in this. There's nope. There's one. And he just keeps going back to it the entire time of like the order. But he doesn't sense that his buddy's gonna show up and kill, try to kill him and his girlfriend, or he never yep. would have let him in. Right, which I love this. This is why I think this one became my favorite, because I just love the story that you can uh skip out on death design by having someone else take your place when you should be dying. And then you take over the length of life they have left. And so the character that gets completely destroyed and distraught from Candace's death 
hears it from Tony Todd when Tony Todd explains that saying, you know, death has a design, blah, 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 but it can be fooled or basically paid off by giving it another life. So the other guy starts contemplating like, man, if I, could I kill somebody? And like, yeah. if I kill somebody and then he realizes like that it's actually true. Cause uh, the one friend of his, that's actually like the uh, warehouse guy manager. Yeah. Yep. Ma- where- warehouse manager almost gets killed and goes to shove the guy that he's fighting with out of the way, but ends up shoving the guy into the giant hook that's coming down and killing him. So the dude dies in his stead in his place instead. And he takes over the length of life that guy has. And yeah. I like, I just love the idea of this and that the fact that one guy's like, yeah, if I murder you now, well, then it will skip over me and I'll live for the rest of my life. Like I'll live your life. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And he goes crazy and it like becomes kind of a cat and mouse. Like when they go to that restaurant and like, I love that end scene with them. Like when they're fighting in that restaurant, cause there's all these ways that death could get them because of, you know, the fryer, the fryers are boiling. The knives are everywhere. The yeah, but he turns spikes. all that on. It's funny yes. that you like this one so much. And I'm not criticizing, but this has nothing about premonitions. Like the more I no. think about it, I'm like, this had nothing on it. There was no like, you know, Sam seeing something and, and trying to avoid it. It was him basically keep going back, as I said before, to the first premonition and tracking how people were going to die and trying to prevent it. And really what this movie did was they it actually allowed number four to be the last one. Because yeah. in the ending scene, it's they're on the plane, and which I you find this. out is flight 180. And they die, setting off the events of the next four films. Yeah, I love so this how was it almost all... like a prequel without yeah. being a prequel. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was literally a prequel without telling us it was a prequel until the very end, like reveal. And right. that's another thing I kind of liked about it is how it just tied everything up in a nice little bow. And like, yeah, I, I think the reason I like it without the premonitions is because besides the first one, I just felt well, the first one and the third one, I just felt the way premonitions were shown were just getting cheesy. So I like that this one decided, you know what, we're just not even going to attempt to show premonitions in this. And let's just make this straightforward. And well, I, I like yeah. That. And I think that's what people want, right? Is they want the deaths. They want that. The premonition piece, we already got that you have no control. By the time we get to the fifth one, we're like, well, we know it's going to happen. You're going to have no control. And, you know, something's going to happen at the end when you think you're going to live and you're going to die. And what this one did differently was that it tied it back to the original. So you have a full circle. Yeah. And I'm wondering if the premonitions just don't, well, no, I guess that wouldn't make sense. But I was like, wonder if the premonitions just didn't happen until part one. And since this was before part one, like it just never happened. No, but no, I think they, sense. no, no, yeah, they one. just, I'm reaching it. They point. never, I think they, when they made part one, you got to think this was 11 years apart. They never right. pictured that this, these movies were going to make so much money. Like this one cost 40 million to make and it made over $157 million at <sighs> in the box office, right? They almost, no, they overly tripled, almost, almost quadrupled. quadrupled their their budget, right? Like these movies were money makers. And for lots of reasons, I think it comes down to premonition and projecting of death and wanting to know whether you have control over death's to sign. And that's why Final Destination movies are so popular. This is yeah. why this concept was so popular. This is why even the shitty one, quote unquote, made the most money in the franchise. Yeah, like, because even like I said, like, right? I may not like the part, the part four that much, but I still enjoy it and have no problem watching it because it's still fun. Like, right? it's just some things I have a little complaints about, but still fun. I like none of these are bad movies. They're all very fun. Well, and they all pull out, pull out, pull, like they all come down to that, you know, thing that we talked about in the first article, the idea of wanting to control, predict, know what's going to happen, avoid death at all costs and not being able to, Yeah. because none of us can avoid it. Eventually when your time's up, your time's up. And I think that this, these movies really capitalized on it really well in the horror genre. They, we talked very early in our episodes about real life representing horror. This represents a real life fear. Yeah. And they, oh, and they took does. real fears of bridges collapsing, car accidents, roller coaster accidents, going to one of those needle spas and having all the acupuncture done, uh, car washes. Like my friend's daughter is terrified of going into a car wash. And I made a joke that has she seen Final Destination before? <laughs> is that why? Uh, you know, like the race car tracks and how fast those cars go. And if something happened and they were to flip off the, the plane crashing. In the first one was really, besides the plane crashing, the other ways that they died weren't necessarily fears. You're not afraid of choking in your bathroom because you slip and fall and you hit the wire and it wraps around your neck. Like 
I don't think I've ever heard anybody having that fear. No, that's very specific type of fear. That, right. No, no, it's too or specific. my mug's going to crack. It, it was almost like a series of unfortunate events yes. in the first one. And in the second, third, fourth, and fifth, it was playing on people's fears of what are people afraid of happening? Making mm-hmm. the wrong new new gym, gymnastics, like see what those gymnasts do all the time. I can't believe this didn't happen until now. Or getting, you know, going to the dentist or having your eye operated on. Like all these things are fears that people have. Like yep. the hands with the hooks and the elevator. Like, you know, it's barbecuing with propane. That can be a dangerous thing too. Like who is in a worry that something could explode? You have to be careful with propane. Like yep. that's why you have to barbecue with charcoal, people. <laughs> That's absolutely why, because <laughs> clearly, well, you know, you guys fill up bags with gas. So yeah, probably yeah, would like, be a good idea. And plus, you know, everything tastes better with charcoal anyways. I guess so. I have it's, a propane barbecue, so I have no idea that it would taste any different. It's a, it's a huge thing. Like at least out here, we always talk about that. You, you need Is that a thing for your cookouts. Yep. You need a charcoal grill and like smoke that food. Smoke it. It's the true way to cook cook on the grill well this has been a really great discussion about final destination i feel yeah. like we found a way to bring in these movies with like following our ethical guidelines of themes <laughs> they um, all happen to be from the same franchise but right that's okay um, i do have one question for you though for the since we're at the end of this sure what would you how would you rank these personally or objectively personally uh personally three is my number one then probably five, then two, then four, then one. Wow. I did not expect one to be at the back. Yeah. No, that's my personal enjoyment. Not which ones I think are the best. Right. Right. Yeah. But that for me, it would be five, two, three, one, four. Like I just, yeah, I, I just wanted to, I was kind of wondering like where yours were at, like which one's your favorite. I knew three was your all-time favorite of all. Yeah. If I was to switch it around and say objectively what I think people like, I would say one, two, five, three, four. Yeah, I could see that. Like I can, right. I can agree with that list. I think that's objectively, if we ask the average person how they rank them, probably what they would say. I don't know. Maybe we can put on comment on our page. How do you rank yeah. the final destination? Final? That, yeah, that's you a good know, idea. Personally, actually. or how do you think generally horror people, you know, rank them? Yeah, I, I would be curious about that. Yeah, let's right. do that. So go ahead, people. Tell us what you think. Yeah. So Scott's going to lead us to the out of the dark section because for once he actually came up with something. I did. That popped in my brain. My brain brain. bubble worked. All right. So for our out of the dark segment, since we're talking about the Final Destination franchise and the rumor of a Final Destination Part 6 coming out, I thought it'd be kind of a neat idea to ask Heather and like we both come up with our own idea but how would you like what type of big accident would you like to see done for a final destination so you know the big big event scene that happens in the beginning of these films the first premonition um I will go first just uh, because I don't know like if Heather had come up with anything yet but I will I had one kind of building up in my head um one that I thought of that would probably make for a horrific yet entertaining style would be being at a rock concert, like some type of heavy metal show or something like that with thousands of people all around you in this crowded enclosure. And then a fire happens. And of course, like typical Final Destination, certain events tend to happen to keep them from being able to escape. People getting trampled, people getting sliced by wires that might be falling from the rafters, things like explosions from the speakers. You know, So like- stuff that's actually happened. Yeah, I was gonna say kind of like that great white concert, like, but like portray like I, I was just thinking like, you know, obviously overdo it with for Hollywood style. Yeah, of course, of course. But like, yeah, like that's one I was thinking of. Like, I have a couple other ones, but that was like one that I like thought that'd be kind of cool to see. In what were your other time. ones? Uh, the other one is it already has happened in our history as well, but something on a giant cruise ship and the cruise ship like sinking. So how would they avoid that? Not go on the cruise ship? Yeah, like that one, like that's the part where I would say, okay, this one might be a bit tough. Either they, yeah, you would have to get to the lifeboats, like they saw in advance that they would have to go to the lifeboats. Yeah, like I was gonna say, they get to the lifeboats and then, yeah, either get to the lifeboats or they see it happening before they get on board. But then obviously the ship would have to go way out there before it actually crashed. (laughs) Yeah, it'd be like the longest fight in this. And he's like, sun's gonna happen. Wait, wait, four hours later, finally, for (laughs) it. Right. Hold on. I'm not crazy, people. Hold on. Hold on. Like, just hold on. <laughs> are we going to get our money back for the Carnival Cruise? <laughs> but yeah, I think the best way would be like uh, picturing like, like COVID-19 that. on the cruise. And yeah, right. Sick. The longest <laughs> find this destination movie ever. 
But yeah, I um, think the whole lifeboat thing would probably be the best way to like kick that one off. Nice. Nice, yeah, nice, nice. Um, so the one I thought of is there's I guess a couple too, but the one I thought of mainly is that you're at a beach and uh there's a uh, people motorboating in the in the water. And what happens is while they're for someone's water skiing, the boat loses control and the water skier gets knocked down, but the boat flips, hitting another boat. And while the boat's flipping, it hits a bunch of people in the water. And then it hits another boat and then it explodes and it kills everyone in that vicinity. So you're in the water and you're swimming around, maybe on like a raft or something with your friends. And you're like, we're going to get out of this water now. What? What? We need to get out of this water now. And like, you're trying to get people to get out of the water and you just crawl onto the, you get everyone out of the water onto the sand. And that's when the boat flips and everyone, and you have to like jump for cover on the sand as the explosion goes and like nine people make it out of the water. Um, I like that. Like, cause that one's back. like also just like very realistic. Right. Right. So I thought of crowded beaches and what could happen and in that kind of given situation. Uh, I think, I think you could do it at like a wave pool, like the yeah. waves are going and then like something happens and like the water becomes electricity and everyone gets shocked and dies. Oh. And right. And you envision it, you're in the middle of the wave pool and you, or maybe you're around the wave pool and you're, and you're trying to get people out and you're pulling somebody out of the wave pool as it happens like the last like your friend or something like that or a boyfriend's pulling a girlfriend out or a kid you could even have a kid and you pull the kid out just in time um yeah yeah wow i like that too i know i'm just like i should really be a screenwriter i'm missing you my totally calling. should <laughs> i know because there's even one that i had but i'm going i don't know if this would be a final destination movie if this was the case but like being on one of those like uh school trips to the zoo and like one of the enclosures not being fully closed and one of the uh wild animals gets out and then like but yeah but there would have to be a mass amount of death right yeah i was gonna say so that to be like a way like other animals break free and like elephant trampling (laughs) you're like guys they have the animals (laughs) that's what i was thinking i'm like it would not feel like it found in a station film but i like i was like yeah that would be just like a when animals attack or zombies type movie (laughs) right oh zombies good old zombies what a fun film that was oh that movie was so ridiculous but anyway right zombie giraffes the, yeah that's the zombie giraffes uh but yeah i i look forward to seeing whatever they come up with final destination i think there's a lot of stuff that could be done that hasn't been done yet um yeah like the synopsis they gave like for part six is like it didn't really give much of a synopsis just said that it deals with first responders hmm. i'm like huh i'm curious to see how this plays out well, and especially with the survival guilt that would be into that. And and because I guess they're kind of having to start the saga again, right? We've yeah. had a complete saga of the Final Destination five films. And now if they're going to restart it, they take a real big risk in restarting it, to be honest, because there's not a simple way to do it now. We've done the full loop. Right. And, it, you know, you really are taking a risk anytime you breathe a life into a new genre or not new genre if you try to bring a genre back or a film series back you really do take a risk of what people will say about those films oh for sure right so we see that happening with the soft films now yes yes we do and i look forward to seeing spiral i have a feeling i will not see it for a couple months still but that's okay right. it can hopefully wait for soon time. you know sometimes you gotta wait for the right one scott yeah sometimes you just gotta jump head first like me you know and stop being at home running your telephone network for your call scott are Hello. you lonely on a saturday night this me is, too i just want to talk this is dangerous smoke show coming to you ladies in the wee hours of the night hey how do i seduce you these ladies scott we're an all-inclusive podcast anybody can call the smoke show all right this is dangerous smoke show (laughs) coming to you how are my fellow humans doing tonight (laughs) would you want me to lather up this is my final destination right now. How do I get off this fucking podcast? <laughs> oh, um, love it. I got this oh oil God. ready for you, babe. And you have like like this mm. like fucking like tube top on and like you're sitting there like I just like talk at night. Maybe we'll have stuff in common. I could just totally see you. Oh my goodness. 1-800 smoke show. That's what that works too, be. actually. And one eight hundred smoke show. He keeps the fires going. <laughs> huh? uh- I'll huh? ignite the fire in your <laughs> loins. Then you'd be like, do you like Dungeons and Dragons? Excuse me, do you like gremlins? I really like gremlins. Did you know 
every new podcast people we talk to i'm so sorry matt and kate like honestly you can't go five seconds on their post without talking about fucking gremlins hey honestly hey even what? Amber and what? Anne, my two friends who don't even know you are like, Scott really likes gremlins, huh? I'm like, yeah, it's a problem. It's, it's a not problem. a problem. It's a problem that you are like so upset by this. <laughs> Look, Smoke Show. Look, <laughs> I know that you're a little big on your britches now because of your 1-800 number. Right. All the memes that are made of you. You living in the Playboy Mansion. And I'm just some lowly chick from fucking Canada that only <laughs> likes Canadian films according to Sander Kane. But like... <laughs> I'm more than that, Scott. I'm more than that. <laughs> you are way more than that. You are you are party pow. I am pow pow party pow. That's You're who pow, I am. Pow, Not pow, really pow, right pow. now. I'm like pow pow sleepy pow. <laughs> Goes to bed <laughs> early because there's still nothing open. But we should make a lead into our next episode. We'll have a very special guest on it. Yes, we will. I am so excited to have him on. He is the one that has pretty much uh, made the smoke show who he is now. <laughs> Thank you, Darren. Yep. Thank you. So Darren Wilson will be joining us. And I cannot wait. He's going to make me, he's going to be so smart. And we're just going to be like, uh-huh. You, you're right, Darren. Yeah. <laughs> Darren, smart. <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of, I'll be sitting there. You can't see me because we're not on video, but I had my teeth over top of my lip. Like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Darren yeah. is so smart. He knows more than we do. We simple, right? Yeah, that's what our we haven't even picked our movies yet. We still have to do that. I yeah. we want to do political horror, and there's so many options. We could do get out. Yeah. This could was, be the was, chance to do get out. Yeah, I was th- I was thinking that would be one that we'd do. What else are you thinking, Scott? Should we do the purge? The purge is just too too easy. Oh, it's low hanging fruit. Okay. Yeah. When it comes to like, we're going to have to, uh, we'll have to think about it more, but like we can do some other ones that have some more deeper social issues. Deep. I mean, this is Darren for crying out loud. We got to bring the, bring our A games. I know. We got to bring the most like random social issue fucking horror movie and be like, all right, Darren, talk about this. You'll talk about that. We'll be like, yeah. Yeah. That was right. good. Damn it. You're right. You know this shit. <laughs> no more so than me. Darren will be joining us. We are so excited. And also, please check out our Legion. Legion patreon special that came out of top five uncomfortable horror films with jay murphy from kill the cast and look forward to our follow-up legion patreon special in june that will be recorded uh about canadian top horror films as well we have a lot of stuff coming down the pipe as well as our controllers up cards down yep, podcast we'll, we'll be as recording well. we'll be recording that on memorial day so that'll be out shortly this episode then that episode will be out so it's like yeah it'll be double dose of smoke show and pow 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 to pow <laughs> or you could call scott's hotline as well whatever whatever works for you you know any listener if you use the code name friday nightmares you get an additional 70 percent off <laughs> what's 70 percent off of free scott <laughs> you get to see me naked Oh boy. You know what? Be careful what you're offering because <laughs> you're throwing out these nudes and these sexy talks. Like you don't know who's listening. That's going to take you up on it. Like, you know, he's, so to give you guys an idea right now, Scott is rubbing himself mm, and yeah. making kissy faces at the camera. Um, like, <laughs> you know, Scott, <laughs> I hope you have an eventful weekend. Maybe you find <laughs> a way to share those kissy faces all around with people. Consenting people, Scott. Because remember, on Friday Nightmares, we're all about consent like, like and I said, inclusion. We are having a Memorial Day party of all fully vaccinated people. So you oh, know what I said in my post? <laughs> all the faces are going to be licked. Oh, man. <laughs> I have a premonition. I have a premonition that Scott's going to get kicked out of the barbecue. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, I can see it happening now. Scott, don't bring the cold slaw. Scott, don't bring the cold slaw. (laughs) 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 Oh my God. Well, thank you if you're still listening and you've stayed with us for this far. Uh, We we also apologize. (laughs) Nah, we regret nothing. (laughs) If you had a premonition that the show was going to be like this, and I have another premonition that we will meet again uh, to continue this, and that Scott will continue to. <laughs> I always like adjusting his glasses. I think he's acting out 
because it's been a long time recorded and he knows he has a fun time this weekend. He has a premonition about having a really good time this weekend. So now he's like, he knows he's going out to the bar tonight. He knows that he's having a, possibly a, a movie time tomorrow. And he knows that he is, he's rubbing his nipple right now. We're still releasing this video to everyone. And he knows that he is going for a cookout slash barbecue for the rest of the world. So he's, he has all these premonitions on how great this stuff is going to be. And he's just ready to party. I am. Yeah, I am just, I'm, I have big shoes to fill. Like you're not able to get out and do as much. So I got to do it for you. Well, somebody has to drink the alcohol and smoke. I the do. Weed. That's true. And bang all them people too. And somebody's got to do it. You know what, Scott? Bang, 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 baby. (laughs) So Scott, what do you have to say to the, to the people? Shit, guys, hold on. Stop, stop. (laughs) The episode's about to end. We can't, we can't. Okay. So until next time, unpleasant dreams. Bye.